this next episode is pretty critical watching if like me, frankly, and maybe lots of people, you feel out of control financially. I uh, mean, whether you earn a lot or a little, it is incredibly easy to not be in control of your finances and the impact that it can have on your life, your wife, your strife is astounding. Welcome to Business Without Bullshit with me, Andy Ori, and we're here to help the millions upon millions of small business owners navigate the modern business world, or in this episode, just everybody help them sort out their finances, because in this episode, we speak to Ken Okoroa for who alongside his wife, Mary, created something called the Humble Penny, check it out, and the Financial Joy Academy and have helped people achieve financial independence and have just written their first book, Financial Joy. Ken is a first-generation immigrant from Nigeria, chartered accountant, MBA, former CFO, who achieved financial independence by the age of 34 with his wife, Mary. And Ken joins us today to talk about their debut book. Here we go. Hey, I'm, I'm super excited to be here, man. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, um... I guess it's a good question, I think, for you mm. uh, to start with. What, what What is keeping Ken up at night? I mean, now you've paid off your mortgage and oh, life's gosh. good. Well, parenting is very challenging. Mm, how old are I, your kids? I'll tell you that. So my son's first son's 11 and a second's nine. So when you have two boys who are super energetic and who think they're smarter than you and, you know, essentially finding their own way, in many ways, it's very challenging to, to raise two boys. I've got a four and a three-year-old, a boy and a girl. At the moment, they still think we're brilliant. Ah, okay. And that ends when they're about six or seven, they start oh, having doubts, man. is it? Yeah, for me, it's been about five, four or five years since I've been arm wrestling with the, with the boys. Oh. And that, that is a challenge. In one way, in one way, it's, it's, um, it's a privilege to do it. But at the same time, it really tests you. That's what I feel. I feel tested every day. But it's parenthood. I think you used the right word. If, if, if my brother said this, to be a parent is a privilege, i.e. it's not something you necessarily get to do. Mm. And with privileges, you know, there's responsibility. It's not like yes. it's, a, it, it's saying it's good or it's bad or it's this or that. It, mm. A privilege is a very good word, I think, mm. for it, don't you? I oh, oh, completely, completely, because... It's like, um, it's hard to describe what it's the joy that comes from being a parent, but at the same time, it's just, um, it's just all the wow. agony. No one, nothing can prepare you. I, mean, I think there are books out there on parenting, but you know, I've not read any books. I've just been like navigating this thing every morning, trying to get ready. It's like you tell them the same things every morning. You're like, put your bags by the door make sure you tie your shoelaces. Training. <laughs> it's the same thing being repeated every morning, but then like. But then you can't, I was listening to a clip actually on social media recently was saying you can't expect your kids to have the same almost level of maturity as you do. No. Like, I'm 40 years old. There's no way I'd, I'd expect them to think how I think. You forget I mean, how long yeah. it took you to yeah. learn this, how yeah. long it takes. I mean, I'm still teaching them to brush their teeth, you know, well, every you day, every day, go. every day. Yeah. I was trying to explain parenting, having a baby was what I was trying to explain to my friend. And I was like, Imagine someone came up to you with like a suitcase and there's a nuclear bomb in the suitcase and they <laughs> attach it to your arm and they say, anything happens to this suitcase. If you hit it too hard, it's the end of the world Ooh. as you know it. And, but you're here, you've got to type this code in every 20 minutes, you know, occasionally an alarm will go off and you've yeah, got to do yeah, something. Yeah. And it's like, and I think it's almost like for someone who's never had kids, it's this sort of, yeah, but what, what we, we always on my, yeah, that's it now. Good that, luck, that is you know, it. Yeah. And, and it's that feeling of sort of this precious thing you bring into the world. But yeah. I think the other thing that's interesting about parenting that someone said to me, which I'm only just starting to experience is, and they loved it. They said, what I love is it's always changing, mm. you know, and they, and you could, you could get frustrated with that aspect, yeah. you know, but actually that's a beauty to it. And I think you have to respect that because I just think for me, I'm observing actually, because our, our children's interests are changing all the time. Like my son's into anime now in secondary school. I've just found out who- Anime, is that yeah. the Japanese yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, he'll be learning Japanese at school as well. So they're, they're evolving all the time. Before it was just playing Roblox. Now it's like, wow, I'm reading books again. I'm rediscovering like reading books. So for me, it's, um, I think you've got to respect that, that change they're going through. I'm, I'm learning to respect it, which is just, this, you know, must look at it from the outside and- not make my own assumptions about what I expect to see, but almost just observe how, they, how their, their interests are, are changing over time. 
And where are you drawing the line on the digital, di- difficult digital age? I mean, you run a YouTube channel. Yes. YouTube is a tremendous place of learning. Are they allowed uh-huh. YouTube? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Keep, they've and... got YouTube channels themselves. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, they create. They create stuff. They pop it on there. We let them do all that stuff because it's, I just think I always, wish- Always, or there was a time when you went, right. Oh, no, no, no. So we, um, as soon as they showed interest, because I mean, they observe us every day. We do this stuff for for our work. I know. So, I don't want my child addicted to my, their phones, they say. Oh, like, no, no. But, that's like, but there's, there's, there, there is a line to be drawn. So ah. our kids don't have phones, for example. Okay. Yeah. So, and we have certain rules around iPad usage and stuff like that. And you control you know, it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, you know, time for creativity. There's time for just, you know, just playing outside in the garden. So we're trying to achieve some balance, but it's an arm wrestle. You know, every day is a different challenge. Every day is a negotiation, actually. Because it's like, oh, dad, you know, you said you'd give me 45 minutes on my PS5. Can I please have 15 more minutes? Kids are the best negotiators. Like, I, I kid you not. I am always being pushed and I'm always being tested. And for me, it's interesting, actually, because I'm learning a lot from just how they think. You know, they're always finding a way. Like, we used to use these codes on, like, the iPads. You know, like, Apple have these... Um, time to, you know, to, to, to cut out when, you know, to stop yeah, you know, yeah. using the device, I forget what it's called, but they found a way around that. They found a way around the passwords. You're right. It, it, you would spend a lot of your time as a child thinking, well, I want X, that video game. So how do I get X? Yes. And you would think about it and then you'd say, well, I could clean cars, you know, I'll go yes. do that or yes. whatever, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. Actually a good example, funny enough. My son was, he, need, he, he wanted money. He's looking, looking for ways to make money. Being that he watches our content. Came back one time, picked him up from school. He said, oh, daddy, I made 21 pounds. I'm like, yeah, what? So he took two pounds to school. They had like a bring and buy sale. Like you, so he found a he way. He traded up. Yeah, exactly. He traded the guy, up Do you remember pounds. the one that did a paper clip? There's a guy who did a paper clip oh, and went really? all the way to a Ferrari oh, I've never or something. seen that. So he, he went from two pounds to 21 pounds. Like for me, that's like 10, more than 10 times his money. So for me, I thought, wow, that's interesting. It, there must be a way we should encourage that. Because for me, I really believe in having an enterprising skill, which I think is just critical. You know, when you get into a job, into like your career and stuff, I think that part of you gets like diminished basically because you're doing your, you know, accountants, you're posting your journals or mm. like you're doing your, you know, all oh, the- let's talk journals. <laughs> this is my man. You're doing, you're you're doing, doing all your stuff, double right? entry. It's a Sunday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I just think that bit is missing, you know, and seeing- Almost the hustle you're suggesting. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Do you, do you think that, do you think you, growing up in Nigeria, I don't, I mean, I only, I, I know what I know about Nigeria is based on the fact that there are a lot of Nigerians here now. My neighbor's yes. Nigerian and a very close friend, you know, our oh, senior tax okay. partner here and- Lovely, you know, you know, the, 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 I mean, my neighbor next door, honestly, this guy's put up me putting on raves for years. He sweeps the front of my house. <laughs> I mean, we're best friends. Oh, you've he got did. A nice neighbor. However, Nab, if you're listening, put a load of stuff on my skip this oh, week. There you go. No, there no, you go. Which <laughs> I, I, I don't mind if it's Nab. You know, my uh, wife is like, Nab's filled our skip. And I was like, it's Nab, let Nab off. You know, anyway, <laughs> but do you feel that the sort of Nigerian culture, is that um, like America's more of a hustle culture? Is it more of a hustling culture there? Yeah, it's definitely, because over there, there's no social, social uh, safety social, net. Yeah, no, no, no bread line. Yeah, yeah. There, you haven't got that safety net like you might have here in the UK, for example. So it's pretty much eat what you kill, you know? So you have to, you have to make it. You've got to find your way, you know? So everywhere, if you look around the world, there's, there's almost like a, Uh, inside joke, you know, Nigerians are everywhere around the world, literally everywhere. So with that attitude, people just want to become successful. However, they define success, you know, they're always trying to find a way to make things happen. So very hardworking. Big disparity too with the oil money and the sort of, there's the sort of us and them slightly, is that fair? a little bit of that, but there's a huge appetite for entrepreneurship, a huge appetite for just creating businesses in different spaces, different, you know, niches, different, doing different things basically. So I grew up, for example, my mum and dad were big on like buying and selling stuff, you know, during the civil war over there. Wow. They had to basically buy Where and sell stuff. Where are you from, stuff. Abuja or no? No, from the, from the, from the East, okay. Imo State. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So they had to really, and then I grew up in Lagos. So they had to really right. um, basically uh, trade their way out of, you know, survival, you know, buying yams and fish and what have you as a way of getting by. So this buying and selling, what we may call entrepreneurship today, it's just been in the blood. It's just literally what, in fact, my surname, 
is uh, Okora for stands for uh, a young man born on, I believe, the third or fourth market day. So back then they used to describe, they didn't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they, they just had market days. So a bit like, I guess, uh, an English person. Well, the four for four. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think, well, I need to remind myself, I think it's the third or fourth market day, uh, four market days. But because of that enterprising, almost that part of who are, you know, you know, my people were my kind of heritage that has always been in the blood. So which for me, tribe are you from? Or I'm from the Igbo tribe. Igbo tribe. Okay. And my wife is from the Yoruba tribe. So okay. we've, we've got, a, that's the biggest one, isn't it? Which one you, you, you're a tribe I've heard of before, but anyway. Yeah. Listen. Well, I don't know who's, which one's the biggest actually, but it depends on what part you're in. So like in Lagos, it's very Yoruba mainly, but they have Igbo people there. So there's a mix. So our children now are a mix, which I think is very interesting because then they, Again, they're exposed to not just culture in the UK, but again, Nigerian culture. It's separate, slightly separate language. Oh, completely, completely and, different. And, and they're completely different tribes these days. Oh, it's, com- there could be different countries. And this is what caused a lot of the tension and stuff in Nigeria. And that was the civil war. I mean, sorry yeah, to yeah, try yeah, and yeah, brush yeah, over yeah, massive yeah, historical yeah, yeah, moments, yeah, yeah. but to huge. give people a sense, is it? Huge. Oh yeah. This is, um, this is a huge thing because difference, again, we're, we're now heading into like very delicate matters. Yeah, sure. Uh, so kind of, you know, tribal, you know, tribal uh, differences, let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, led to, led to a lot. Okay. I mean, I find the word, you know, I use the word hustler, you know, I always think with Americans, they, they have to hustle again, no breadline. Yes. And in Britain, we find it a little bit confusing sometimes. Like if, if, you know, I've seen this, that an American would do something who's your friend and then charge you for it. Like, oh, I did that thing. So I took five pounds and you're mm-hmm. like, well, you find out they did and you're like, yeah, but you're my mate, man. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. give it to me. It was just yeah. a bag of Chris. Why are you making money? Off yeah, my- yeah, yeah, but I yeah. got it from the shop from you. It's like, yes. but they grow up with an attitude of, it's just business, man. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing is the word hustle is, it's quite a negative word. Whereas really... Making money is is selling it for more than you bought it for, and ultimately, an entrepreneur. And a, is there a difference between an entrepreneur and a hustler? I mean, you we could come up with differences. Yes, but their purposes affect. You know, they're very similar. I guess at the root of it, I think of it as an entrepreneur solves problems. Basically, nice. Yeah, that's literally how I see it. You know, it's like um, I. You know, I, I have this chat with our children all the time. You know, like I was having a conversation on the way to school yesterday and I was explaining, I had this analogy for, to help them remember how a business makes money. And I said, imagine uh, the business was an aeroplane and an aeroplane needs two engines to actually be able to move and fly, you know, both engines. Imagine the first engine on the left-hand side was sales and the engine on the right was marketing. Oh, nice. Like the, it. The, the, the business would not actually, the aeroplane would not get anywhere without those engines. It might fly you're on You're going to be on a plane and your son's going to say the marketing <laughs> department's broken down. Dad. Yeah, well, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> it, could fly, it could fly with one engine. It could fly with marketing yeah. and business, but it needs both, you know? So mm. I kind of look at it that way. Um, business and it's about solving problems and, you know, marketing and sales are all part of that whole process of, trying to identify a problem. How do we solve it? How do we, you know, create more visibility, more awareness? How do we essentially move a customer or a lead from this whole stage where they've just figured out what we're doing to a point where we can actually target a pain point and help them to solve a specific problem. And to be honest, is that not partly what you and your wife are doing generally? Yes. You're trying to demystify things. 100%. We know as accountants, people, you must be in meetings like me. Well, you're an accountant uh, and everyone's like scared (laughs) of you. And you're like, look, I really don't know at all. But if you want to ask me an accounting question, I'm happy to have a crack. But demystifying is really important. Was this, was it having kids that had an effect too on you wishing to sort of gain? It's It's a mixture. So for me, it all began by moving to the UK. So when okay. I, when I moved here, years old. Yeah, 14 years old, Was I moved there. We did very difficult, huge cultural difference. I had On your much, own with your mum and dad? Mum, my, my dad was here already. Right. Moved there with my mum and my siblings. Uh, How many siblings? So I got a brother and two sisters. Very nice. Me too. Moved here and it was incredibly challenging because huge cultural difference. Although I spoke English, it was a, in a different way, huge Nigerian accent. 
Oh, really? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, of well, course, you've well, been here. Yeah, it was you, the first time I'd got onto an aeroplane. No, of course, it's a very, almost, obviously, very classic Nigerian accent. Yeah, but it's a very yeah, polite. Yeah. You guys are very polite, which is a great cultural fit. Yes, I'd say so. And for me, it was it was extremely difficult. And the bit about, the bit that connects to what we do today is actually the bit around having no money. Because when you move to a new country, particularly if you have challenges economically and as well as challenges with trying to fit in and settle in. There's a whole settlement process. And if you have those challenges and you have no money and you're giving your money all, all, all the time to lawyers and solicitors who are fighting your they case. They make it expensive. Oh yeah, it's expensive. You know, What, fighting your visa case? Oh yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Right, Residency right. and all of that. And so going through that and seeing that money plays such a critical role. And when you don't have money and you have challenges around like how you make money, for me, just going through that was a big motivation for wanting to one day become financially not, independent. Yeah, not not be not be a victim of this position or not be a victim of not having money. So you couldn't, so that you needed quite heavy, I know, because we're immigration lawyers. Immigration law is, is tough stuff, yes. you know, expensive stuff too. It's very it's complicated. expensive. Every time you fill a form in, it costs money. Every time it would you send have been an cheaper when you were 14, out. it's gone up, but it's still expensive to come. Well, it would have it. been expensive relatively. Relatively, right? yeah. yeah. Relatively. It was, uh, it was crippling, actually, because, again, earnings potential was very little because you couldn't really go to a job center and go and get a normal job. There's so many limitations yeah. we faced. So it meant like when a-, a Oh, because you can't even, when you come in, even though your dad lived here, yeah. I mean, it was so shit about this. My uh, my wife's in Trinidad and her parents aren't allowed. They've got three kids here, two working as doctors in the NHS and uh, they can't live here. You know, we're quite yeah. shitty about the family stuff in the UK. Oh, we're yeah, very like, time. oh, well, you know, it's just some, another Indian family trying to bring in their 12 yeah. relatives yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, 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 and it's yeah, like, yeah. they're a family, man. Oh yeah, there's-, there's America uh, doesn't do this. <laughs> Most of Europe doesn't do this, yeah. as far as I understand it. But, yeah. but okay, that's interesting. You came in and felt, felt well, the lack of power, basically. Oh yeah, completely. Um, and there's the whole challenge as well of fitting in, you know, fitting in here. If you're completely, if you, if you don't know the culture, you don't have any f established friendships. So the thing I learned was if you have no money, life is crap, basically, because you're literally, you feel like you're below everybody else. You're below the most broke person on the street. And then you add the fact that there's a shame around that. You know, because you can't really talk to a lot of people about it. People might judge you. And so for me, that is really when I combine that with the fact that at, then at the extreme end, once I'd say making my way through education, university, doing my ACA and all those things, working up my career. And I got to, you know, at the top of it, 2020, when I, when I worked, I actually left my career in that, in that year. But I was working as a chief financial officer. And in that space, you're in high net worth, super high net worths and, you know, those are the kinds yeah, of people. Yeah, we did an investment, edge yes, investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was um, a, uh, a, a venture capital business. And in that space, you're more, um, you know, you're seeing the other extreme, you know, where people have so much wealth um, and- They're not, know, They've got their own problems. Yeah, that's a whole different set of problems. It was, but for me, given the journey where I'd come from, that, that massive gap was a problem. You know, I'd be in a meeting and I'm like, the guy sitting over there is a billionaire or he's worth hundred million or he's worth 50 million. But then right outside on high street is a homeless person lying on the floor asking you to put a pound in their, in their cup. Just how, how insane is that? You know, so for me, I, I, my wife and I thought, you know what? Cause we've been on this journey ourselves and we'd seen it from that pure poverty stage, economic poverty stage to now having worked up and trying to figure our ways and, and been on our own money Your journey. wife also would, came from uh, humble beginnings yeah. here because she was living here already. Yeah, yeah, she was born and bred in London, in Hackney, right. not the gentrified Hackney of today, yeah. very different world. 20, actually long, she lived there for 27 years, so from birth, from 1983. Right, right. So, so she's seen it all and lived in, you know, Homerton in East London. So to have been through that and been through, again, her parents came in the seventies and she was born into London and that whole cycle, we both felt, you know what, what we've been learning when we looked around and looked at who was talking about money, we couldn't really relate to the way money was being put out there. And where? Like, yeah, where? Where do you find this yeah, stuff? Yeah, I mean, before yeah. YouTube, I mean, they didn't teach it at school. Exactly. It basically, unless your parents teach you about it, yeah. you're screwed, yes, you know? that's it. 
So we started as a blog. We bought a domain name, 99p. Back in the day Back when blogs day, were yeah, blogs. blogs. Yeah, man. So we bought a domain in 2017 and, you know, we just said, let's just start writing. You know, I had a day job, proper like side hustle. My wife had her job. So we were just doing it. I was writing three blog posts a week, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just putting it out there to try and see what would stick. And then gradually the, say, noticing the media show interest, I'd get a call saying, oh, come to BBC Radio 4 and come and talk about, you know, and I'd be in Marleyburn and the BBC office is just like not far away, about 10 minute walk. And I'd go during my lunch break. So this is how this whole thing started, you know, just by that desire to want to help to demystify it and talk about it from my own lived experience, which is like, this stuff ain't easy, you know, when you're a couple or when you're a single person or when you're a parent and you're trying to manage your money, it's tough. You know, it's really difficult with so much happening, but it's how do you actually do that? How do you navigate it? What are some of our experiences of that journey? Does it come down to discipline? A lot of it is behavior. It? Behavior it comes a lot. A lot of it comes down to habits and behaviors. You know, are you, what is your relationship with money? Like, where did that, where did that relationship originate from course, therapy it, isn't it yeah does it come from oh this is I'm pretty not deep. actually good with money and my dad is good with money but my dad oh, worked all the time and my, my, my mom is useless with money she never had it okay and then suddenly you know my dad came in his like her life and made her pay off all her debts and very organized about it and then he finally made money in the 80s and the accountancy firm grew wow. and now she now she's Clueless. I mean, I grew up in the supermarket because I'm born in 1978. So I don't really remember our family before we weren't, I guess, I, you know, we're very, we get uh, misjudged as being rich because we're professionals. You know, you're good at only good living. You have to work a lot. Yep. And it's, and they're very generous. So they're really generous, both my parents, you know, oh, you know, they want to spend their money. They believe in spending it, which is, oh, a, which, is which is a, Actually a disease that oh, mostly, mostly people don't spend their money and it's sad, you know what I mean? But he, my dad does it in the right way. I spend it the wrong way. He spends it from a position of knowledge. Every Sunday he sits down and does his books. Wow. Okay. You know what I mean? Anyway, that's my world. But I was brought up by my mum. Okay. Who couldn't, she was, oh darling, I got this thing. Oh, terrible, bar amazing <laughs> bargain. Oh really? What'd you buy it for? Oh, uh, so I think it was um, two, 200 pounds. Why? What was it before? I, um, I, <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's not a bargain then, mum. <laughs> wow. Well, <laughs> so that's really interesting because the research, and we talk about this a lot in, in the book we've written, is a lot of the research around your relationship with money is connected to what they refer to as your money blueprint, which is, which is typically formed by the age of seven. By the age of seven, you've established, you know, your view about certain things. For example, what is your view about money, for example? And it depends on what your, how your parents viewed money, actually. Mm -hmm. So- a lot of parents, like growing up, for example, like my parents loved them to bits, but their, their, their finances were completely opaque. Like he didn't know what she was doing. She didn't know what he was oh, doing. Oh, interesting. Her. Not transparent between yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yet. Yeah, that's no. important, you think? Well, that's very important, actually, because there's a, there's a thing. I don't know if you've heard of financial infidelity. This is quite a big thing, you know, where, for example, if you are in a relationship, like we had a recent one where a couple who recently just got married uh, had been through uh, almost like a marriage preparation process. And then once they got married, the lady said, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, I'm in 21,000 pounds of credit card debt, for example. You know, that kind of stuff. Mm. Because, there, you know, there's no, there's the, no the, conversation the dis about Dishonesty. Money. And I guess extreme versions yeah. of taking a credit card out in the wife's name. Yeah, and it could, be, it could be the other way around. It could be that the husband or the partner just loves buying stuff on Amazon and, you know, he might be late, late watching Netflix at night and suddenly flips the phone up and starts to buy things on Amazon on money he doesn't what you're have. Talking about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I mean. So what you find is, is that a house that is divided does not stand, right? So if you've got, you know, a family or a household where two people are pulling in different directions... Oh, I see. One side's really trying to save money and the other side's just burning exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And then, and then there's the problem it creates because it creates arguments, disagreements, leads to divorce in many ways. So money is a big topic when it comes to couples, you know. And you think, you know, what's your practical advice there? Because I'm, I'm thinking of my dear wife who, as a medic, also doesn't understand money because no one ever pays her any. She just gets really annoyed every time someone, you know, they you pay anyone £20 an hour. £20 an hour? £20 an hour for that? She gets £7 an hour at night with 30 letters after her name oh, as wow. a doctor. Anyway, but, but your advice to uh, parents would be, 
sit down and talk about your finances together? So we have a, an idea we refer to as the money day. The money day is a day Ooh. of, well, exactly. So it's a day of the week, or it could be every two weeks, where you actually sit down and talk about money. Once a week? Could be once a week or once every two weeks. Complete. It just depends on who- you know, As a family? As a, as a couple, for as example, a couple. If, you know, in a, whoever is in a relationship. And it could be that, and we always say the person who is very good at the admin- you know, pulls together. We call it the home CFO. So the home CFO pulls together all the all t-shirt. The stuff. You got t-shirts on the website. Okay. For that. Pull- <laughs> Actually, you've just given me an idea. You should do that. <laughs> so the, the baseball caps. Yeah, there you yeah. go. The home CFO pulls together all the stuff. So they pull together like their net worth calculation, budget, you know, income and expenditure. They pull it all together and then they have to communicate with the partner. So you sit down, make a cup of tea, Ideally, do it in a place that's different from your home. So a different environment. Uh, so, you know, the vibes are good. So you're actually quite relaxed and there's no judgment. This is the key thing because it's very easy in a relationship to point the finger and go, oh, babe, you bought that. And, you know, yeah. and, and then it becomes a blame game. Oh, so you set the rules of engagement. Exactly. As, we're not going to judge each we're other. Not fighting we're just going to talk about it. Yeah, just talk about it's it. Money. And, and the goal being that we're not just talking about where has the money gone. We're also talking about how are we building some wealth here? God, this would change. This would change my behavior immediately. No, because, seriously, it does because work. if I got to show my wife everything I bought each week, she she'd be like, "Why are you buying all this fucking clutter?" No, but she keeps telling me gets, to stop buying clutter. To, it gets more interesting because one thing we found is is and you know this as an accountant, if you've got certain controls in place, for example, my wife and I, if you're going to spend more than fifty pounds, you've got to tell the other person. <sighs> ah, see. Cause, cause like, cause that way. Well, that's just up to the amount of stuff I buy on oh, 50 quid. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> 50 pounds, the materiality level. That's yeah. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it could oh, be, I'm it could be this account and chat. It could, yeah. it could be for, you know, whatever number you want. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but you set a level that yeah, let's not be like, pedantic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Cause then you're like, you're actually being respectful to each other. You're like, okay, we're actually both building wealth for, or trying to build some wealth for a household. And let's, you know, let's be real because there's sometimes we have an itch to want to buy something but it, the other person actually keeps you accountable because it could be that, oh, I want to spend this 200 pounds on these headphones. But then it's like, I told her about it. And she's like, nah, calm down, man. You know, like 200 pounds. What about the ones we, I bought you yeah, for your exactly. birthday? Thank uh, you. Yeah, they're exactly. shit and I can't yeah, face you're telling like, suddenly you. I want these wireless ones, yeah, there's yeah. noise cancelling. You know, so having that conversation just stops us just doing silly things with money. Oh, it's terrifying me already. Once a week sounds quite a lot. No, you could be once a month. Once could be, a month. Yeah, it could be once a month. Yeah, could yeah. Be one, you know, just whatever works for anyone. But I think that conversation is so key because if you think about it, what's the point of building a relationship, having children or, you know, all this stuff and, you know, trying to build a, a loving relationship if- it's not under, a, underpinned the, by financial- yeah, exactly. If it's- Honesty if, and security. You. And transparency. And transparency. Like if that's not there- what, why are you doing How'd you it? get the uh, private uh, birthday present? You know, oh, oh, you thought is, I was going to say so, something no, else. No, 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 but this is. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to say something else. <laughs> so this comes down to, so we talk about this idea of creating a joyful spending plan. It's effectively a budget, but with joy right in the middle of it. So where you're like, I'm going to allocate a particular portion to us having fun. Because a lot of time money is just a boring topic. People, I don't want to talk about yeah, it. Enjoy yeah, yeah. Enjoy, you know, enjoy your money. Yeah, enjoy your money. It's very important. Now you can then allocate a portion of your monthly income to, you know, fun or to surprises. You could put it into your, you know, your individual uh, okay, accounts. So I get, well, I've got 500 quid. Yeah, I'm exactly. going to do something for your 50th. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. So yeah. that way there's still that surprise element, but it comes from an organized place. It's not just like chaos and yeah. we don't know how much we're making. We don't know how much we're spending. Well, you buy them something and they're like, that didn't cost 500 quid. Yeah. Where's the other 400? <laughs> 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 well, me and the lads. <laughs> That's great. I really, I really love what you're saying. I mean, and actually I could give a reverse example that my dad does the books every Sunday and my mom would start pacing around the kitchen, looking very sweaty, <laughs> starting to talk to me in a rather strange manner. And then at some point you hear, Mary! Oh dear. and she'd come down with a little checkbook, you know, and he'd be like, what the hell is oh this? Dear. And that's, you set up this conversation. Don't be, it mustn't be um, offensive to one another yeah. because that didn't change my mom's behavior. Interesting. Well, it did, I'm sure, but she would still occasionally think, oh, fuck it, I'm buying yeah. it or whatever. And not ring him up and say, I'm thinking about getting this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a sort of, the, the loop doesn't work. This I like, because this could become fun. It's yes. money day. Yeah, it I is. I might need a rebrand. Yeah, you might need to call it whatever you want to call yeah, it. But yeah, yeah. We call it money day. But there, this, there is one thing that underpins this, and this is a challenging bit, which is this idea. Imagine a scenario where 
let's say a man makes, I'm going to make this up, like 80,000 pounds a year, mm -hmm. right? And the wife maybe makes 40,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. Or it could be the wife makes 80,000 and the man makes 40,000, sure. whatever. But there's an there's imbalance, a difference, right? Here's the challenge I've, we've noticed with a lot of couples is where one person says, I'm paying 50% of the bills, even though I make twice the other person's mm. income. Right, so there's this arm wrestle over like, what's the because most- Because I use half of the stuff. Yeah, like what's the most equitable way of doing this? So the, the idea we have, and this wouldn't apply to everybody, one thing that helps us is this concept of our money, not his and her money. So that means even if you make 80K Especially and I make you're 40K, married. yeah, particularly in a, like a, Legally, a, a committed relationship. Yeah. Even if you make 80K and she makes, or he or she makes 40K or whatever, the combined amount is the household's money. Because then that removes pressure. And then out of that combined money comes household expenses, food shopping, mortgage or rent, you know, whatever you guys yeah. are paying for. Because that way, you know, there isn't this very awkward like, oh, let's do it by 50, 50, 30, 70, whatever. Now I get that that wouldn't always work for everybody. But what I found personally for me is just removed like the, we say in my, in my, in my, in my, well, you know, my Nigerian culture is remove the wahalas. The wahalas is the problems. Oh, I love that. <laughs> the wahalas are the yeah. wankers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just removed the wahalas, which is the, just, the troubles. The, the troubles, the, the, the problems. The, the problems are gone. When Do you it, know, it's reduced. funny that, and I've been through divorce and I've got many people and friends going through it at the moment or just been through it or, you know, I'm going to go through it. I can see it. But anyway, there's a lot, it's all about money at the end. I mean, really you can get divorced. If you don't know how it works, you can get a decree nicely and a decree finally or something. And there are two steps and you have to be a part of a certain period, which is all about your sort of thing with God and love and that the relation you're not together and they shag someone or I've got a reason enough time. We're not married. But if you haven't done your E9 form or whatever it's called, your financial declaration, have it signed off by the court open season, 10 years can go past. You become a billionaire. Then oh, the wow. other partner can say, well, I, if, if it wasn't for me, oh, interesting. if it well, wasn't for me, you know, I was there when they of had course, a, yeah. went to the toilet, um, whatever it was. No, I'm being facetious, but it's amazing that at the start of a relationship or to your point, during a relationship, we aren't talking about money and there's a lot of, is it a repression or, in, you know, in this country, we're particularly uncomfortable talking about money. Is it the same it's in a Nigeria? Taboo, taboo. It's taboo. A taboo. Not in America so much, but they still have the same problems. Yeah, there are still the same problems. I think there are cultural differences. Yeah. So in places like, say, I'd just say Nigeria, for example, yeah. in kind of back in the day, and it's still largely like that. There's a big imbalance between men and women in terms of like, you know, man of the house and, all, you know, the traditional, and it's the same, I'm sure here in the UK. Woman of the house. You know, woman in charge of the house. Yeah, there was a, Your uh, missus is in charge of the house. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> Just know, to be if, I, if I want peace, then yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I gotta, you know, I've got, I've got to do what I need to do. Right. The so, man who was in the longest ever relationship I heard on radio four, uh, and they said, Oh, congratulations on your longest radio. They turned to him and he said, Oh, you know, what's the secret to long relationship? He said, two words. Yes, dear. Ah. <laughs> Which is very true. So yeah. I interrupted. No, I was just saying, you know, um, the, the cultural differences, there are those cultural differences that have um, kind of led us to kind of where we are, I guess. So the same in Nigeria, but like you say, in America, although- The um, taboo of money. Yeah, the taboo of money. Although um, people do talk about money a bit more openly, there are, there's the, there's the problem of consumerism. So culture of consumerism creates a big, a big, a big problem. So people still have problems with money. So it's not just the fact that we don't talk about money. It's also what other culture, societal cultures. So you think about like Instagram and the fact that like all the ads are always in your face and, you know, I read a stat, right? That said, so Meta, Meta, they did this research that, surveyed 16, I think 16,000 people across 13 countries, including the UK, something like 82% of people, and I think that's the number, make a purchasing decision on Instagram. I do it all the time. Uh, it worked out. I like gadgets and it keeps showing me gadgets well, that I can't go, handle it. And yeah. most of them under 50 pounds, so I'm in the clear. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, that's really interesting, actually, because you so think about So they're making a it, purchase. It. Well, it's because they're becoming their own universes and you're not, and I'm not researching it. Yeah. And it's, it's that, the immediateness. It, it, it's, it's that the fact that and it, there's a, there's a, there's something to this related to behavior. So one of the ways of changing behavior is to create more friction, i.e. make it harder for things to happen. 
but with the likes of social media and stuff, because all the systems are connected, it's like one click purchase yes. for Amazon. Like you can easily just buy stuff. There's the frictions removed, right? It's like paperless. Dangerous. You could pay with your watch, you can pay with your phone. They actually have a, a term for this. It's called financial abstraction. Wow. It's a world where money has become less and less real that we lose. Yeah, you just beat. Yeah, you just, you can't, like, you can easily spend 500 pounds. How much pounds. is an oyster? How much does any, how many Londoners know how much it takes Bigger. to travel the tube? I, we go. looked no one, up no for one really other, No one knows. Yeah, no one they knows keep that. changing it yeah. every week, yeah. you know? You know, so it's like, um, uh, people just don't know. You could spend 500 pounds like that. Okay. But if I gave you 500 pounds or 500 dollars or whatever in cash, you'd mm. be like, whoa. Particularly if it's in like tenors or 20 pound notes, you're like, I'm not sure if I want to spend all that money. So it's interesting the digitization, that shift away from physical money to digital money actually makes us all poorer. And it, I like that talking to your love partner, it's such an interesting, it brings back in a control. Yes. I mean, I, I, it'd be interesting to ask what others say, but I what we really love about it is that, you know, I'm really lucky to be in a really special relationship, but in a way, if you can't sit down and have that conversation, it's sometimes easy to accept a relationship. Oh, it's all right, isn't it? You know, it's okay. Yeah. Other people have problems, blah, blah, yeah. blah. You're not able to sit down and have those conversations with your most loved person who you're going to spend the rest of your life with according mm -hmm. to the contract. You should be thinking seriously about whether this relationship is what you thought it was. Oh, know? yeah. And that's a really horrible thing to say to someone. But mm -hmm. because it, I did give you another way. We're an old school partnership. We got... 11 people at the top who have mm -hmm. to share profits on a sure. yearly basis. Money, there's something about money, talking about money. So we get our profits at the end of the year. We sit around that table. We have metrics, how many hours I've worked, how many clients I've got. Sure. Have I? But, you know, it's more subtle than that, what you bring to the party. Mm. And every year there will be someone who will cry or get upset. But we have to be really close friends mm. or... Friends is the one where we have to re have really high respect for each other mm -hmm. that to take, you know, so we do it in stages too. So it's sure. like, okay, here's what the raw information says. Then we wait a couple of weeks and then you get a chance to do it and you mm -hmm. feed back on an individual oh, level to one person. Cause as a group, you can't talk about it, but anyway, I'm sort of rambling around that point, but I think your control is such, such an, an interest. The control there is that there's eight, 11 of us around the table mm -hmm. and I have to justify, you know, so this year someone said, look, I really think I've done this, that, and the other, and we all talked about it and we were like, wow, we don't really see it like that, mm, you know? And then they actually obviously were a bit upset, but then they apologized a week later oh, okay. and said, you know, I've been thinking about it and you're, because you're my partners, Yes, you know, I respect you. Mm. And I've realized if you all think I'm wrong, I respect that yeah. and I'm wrong and it's yeah. okay. And it's okay. It's I'm wrong. If you, are there other controls you could recommend to people or other things they could do? Or is that, that's the founding principle almost. Well, the, or what, if you don't have a partner or, you oh, know. Okay. So there's many things. So if you are someone who is just single, for example, uh, which many people are yeah. out of choice and out of, you know, situation, they, I find that having an accountability partner is so powerful. Let's say like for example, a friend, yeah. yeah, like a friend or, you know, a sibling or whoever, someone who you in a position of trust, basically. Like your accountant. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not your accountant, but, <laughs> but somebody else basically. So imagine that the reason I say this is imagine that someone's trying to get out of debt, for example, right? So debt's a very, very very sticky. Yeah. Because debt, the thing with debt is debt can feel like you're in a a, a, a dark hole basically mm. and no one else is in that hole with you right mm. that's how it can feel sometimes in fact i see debt as for some people the debt is almost like having scales on your eyes and you can't see opportunity because you've got so much debt and you feel like you're digging a bigger hole all the time and if, you, if you're a single person and you don't have anybody you're speaking to or anybody holding you accountable for your goals for example you're trying to say get out of your credit card debt or whatever debt you've got. If you don't have that, that is a problem because you could be compounding the problem. So a control, another one could be, I've got account an accountability partner. I said, you know what? For the next 12 weeks, I'm trying to get rid of that 1500 quid credit card balance I've got with, you know, that company, right? That's my thing. And if you just check in with them, hey, every, you know, week and a half, whatever, how are you doing? How's life? Hey, let's hang out. Oh, and by the way, how's it all going with that goal you've got? 
that really helps because it feels like you're reporting to somebody, although you're not. It feels like someone's checking in on you. Does it work as a help you. friend? I that, something like that always suggests. It's like advice from a third party or a therapist or someone. Yeah. Strangers' advice are almost more powerful than your friends. Or even, or even, or even um, a lot of the um, dead advisors like um, Step Change and they're you know, good. That I don't oh, know. They, they do all that. You know, you know cap try and support Christians you. against poverty. It's the, not the, as the strong as the it's the couple thing, though, is it? Oh no, no, it's not. But this is the thing: is if if you're not a couple, you're not a couple. No, right? you're not so, a couple. So it's, I'm trying to find an alternative way of creating that accountability. You know, it could work well if you found the right person. Yeah, it's yeah. hard. There's something about um, uh, the couple relationship which has leverage, isn't it? You know, yes. uh, you, you could find it annoying a friend ringing up, when, if, especially if you were depressed about it. You'd be like, you know mm. what, fuck off, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know why I asked you to do this. No, yeah. you said even if you tell me to fuck off that I'm not going to fuck off. With, yeah, you know, yeah, so, yeah. I'm exaggerating, but. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's, um, I mean, I guess, I guess is the, is the good advice of finding that right person. I think it's almost, it's almost may, you know, over the long term, can you have it like a, um, you know, you have a sponsor in Alcoholic Anonymous. It's almost mm. like you almost need to find, and that's yeah. a third part. And that's saying, community. Why don't we look after each other for the long yeah, term? That's community, right? So that's the other thing. So you got like the debt, I mean, just random examples, like the debt for a community, you got, they're different communities and some people even follow a particular hashtag. I hashtags. preferred your accounting though. I go and account to them and I text yeah. them saying it's yeah. going to be more than 50 quid. Cause I, as a friend, that's it, you know, it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, don't buy that mate. Yeah. Honestly, it's not that great. Yeah. You know, and I've I think that's, and, that, and I think that again, that comes back to culture, doesn't it? Because if you think about it, if we don't talk about money and we feel uh, very almost icky about talking about it, it presents a big challenge because then a lot of us struggle in silence, you know, it just, going through stuff, you know, a friend invites you out to some drinks, you know, you're deeply in debt, but because you can't communicate about it, you still go out and spend money you don't have, which creates you're more ashamed, of a problem. Yeah. Because you're ashamed because you don't want to talk about it. So it comes back to, is our culture, say in the UK and beyond, is that culture changing gradually? Is it okay for me to say to you, look, look, man, I've got some debt and like, I can't really come with you on that holiday or I you can't. Know, so you know, so strange like, I, that because the less you have money, my experience is, is, you know, I'm someone who's had money, so I'm privileged. So I don't mind saying to someone, oh, I can't buy that. Yeah. In fact, it's like, it almost, you know, it's, it's going to sound ridiculous to people, but that's okay. You can laugh at me. But, you know, it's more like, oh, okay, you, that's acceptable to say that, that, you know, oh, I don't have the money. Okay, that's, you know, I can't, I, I don't want to say it's like you're proud to say it, but it's like, oh, it's factual. It's mm. like, oh, good. And then the flip, people I've been close with who've come from nothing. Mm. You know, I remember picking up a girlfriend from the um, uh, tube stop because she couldn't pay her way out. So they okay. started trying to find her and stuff. She didn't have any money. And she said their machines are all broken. Mm. And it turned into this massive fight. And when I turned up and like, I had to get her out of it and I just paid and stuff. And they just got her in the car and she cried and cried and cried. And then I was like, were their machines broken? She's like, of course our fucking machines weren't broken, man. Mm. You know, and I was like, I didn't explain more. And then I was like, oh, and I've seen that obviously many times with people. So yeah, there's this, there, this sense of shame of not having money. Whereas if you have money, it's okay to say you don't have it. It's ironic. Yeah, it's, it, it is. I, I think that part of that shame you talked about is, it's just the realities of life, man. I think it needs to be, it's to be normalized. You know, people well, just understand to- with shame mm. that, people aren't judging you like you think like yes. there's lots of people, lots of people in London with money. Mm-hmm. And if you said, I, don't, I can't pay mm-hmm. no, all of the people with money would think, well, fair enough. Mm. You know, you know, you can't yeah. pay, you can't pay. Yeah. You're worrying about people's perception. who are also poor like you. Yeah. And I don't know. You tell me if you heard someone say, you know, I can't pay as a poor person. Do you think, Oh, that's, you know, that's pathetic or something. Mm. I doubt it. Do you? No, no, you wouldn't. You no, wouldn't, you, wouldn't. you wouldn't. So the shame no. is more false. It's a sense of, it's again, a tribal thing that you're in this group of people yes. and that somehow you're a less good person because you've shown that you don't have financial, you don't have money right there. Yeah. I don't know. It's so complicated shame. I find it like in so many circumstances, it's your perception. It's nothing to do with it's the reality. Invented. And it's, it's invented. invented. Yeah. It and is. then it leads to this darkness. Yes. Loneliness. It, 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 it leads to so much more, you know? So I just feel like, and then you throw in the fact that there's a lot of social pressure, you know? So there's a, okay, take, take trends around things like weddings, right? A lot of Gen Zs and millennials get into that stage where they get married, having children. Then you got things like, I remember reading this one article where this girl 
I was invited to like a, a mate's like Hindu or something. And it was meant to cost, I think it was like three grand, you know, and it, it and there was a big deal around, you know, and that's per person. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think they had to go somewhere. Maybe it might've been abroad. It's a big deal Doesn't around that. Doesn't surprise like, me. Do you, do, how do you say no? Like particularly yeah. if it's like your best mate and you're like, look, I really want you to come, like come support and me. And I don't want you to pay and, for me. Yeah, And then you're like, well, I actually don't have the money. But how do you tell that person I don't have the money without them getting upset? And then the friendship doesn't get like, you know, like ruined or whatever, or fractured. So again, it speaks to this whole idea of what we value most. You know, is it really the friendship that's valued or the fact that they're my friends because they can afford to pay to come for my- Well, you're talking about the loneliness of wealth. Yes. I mean, you know, not many people can travel first class or business class. And when you have money, you tend to start- wanting, you know, fancy restaurants. You know, I, I've done this to my friends without that many too. We, we, I, you know, we used to have something called Steak Club and then one night there were like 20 people there and the bill came at 90 quid. We'd gone to the Gaucho in London. Oh, okay. And I mean, and, I, and everyone, people were getting upset. Most of my friends are broke musicians and stuff. But I was like, guys, you've come to the Gaucho. <laughs> I mean, in London, and you had steaks and wine all night. Yeah, that's not and now, cheap. Man. And now you're in fucking shop. That the bill's ninety quid each. And that's actually, not cheap. For, for for three of my best friends and me, who who have better incomes, I guess I don't sadly know anyone who's doing trivially tri- well. But you know, other professionals or whatever, we then formed Platinum Club, where we would spend mm. ninety pounds was our plan. But anyway, that's a silly story. But you know, it, it it's. Um, I would sometimes take someone, oh, I want to go eat here. Selfishly, I want to eat here. I yeah, know the yeah, food's yeah. really good and I want that bottle of wine because it's fucking wicked. And yeah. then I would always say to the friend, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I'm paying, I'm paying. But then I learned people don't like that. Hmm. Some some people find that really upsetting that I'm, I'm putting them in a position that, you know, I'm paying for them. Sorry, I'm rambling. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, yeah. is that you, you, you don't feel so or? No, that, that definitely happens. And I think, again, it's this thing where I think it's communicating with people. If you're going out with friends, just be clear up front, like who's doing what, you know, how's it going to play out when we go out? Is it that we're just okay? You know, everyone orders something and everyone would just split the bill four ways or whatever. Or, be clear. You know, just be clear. I think transparency, whether it's in a friendship or relationship or whatever, takes you very far. It actually removes any ambiguity. Yeah. And, it just, it and just, also it's funnest when everyone can relax and have fun and not actually go to a fancy restaurant. Oh yeah, man. And I mean, actually in the, in British culture, uh, uh, the pub is an amazing institution. The mm. way there's so little pressure, you can buy dark Coke if you want. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's good. A, a pub has got this wonderful openness. I yes. think it's a venue to hang out. Yes. You know? And the beauty of, and this is one thing we speak about as well. We teach a lot on is you don't sometimes need a lot of money to actually still feel like you're having fun. Yeah. I think a lot of having fun is intention. It's actually saying, do you know what? Let's say it's a sat- it's, let's say it's a Friday or in fact, let's fast forward. Let's say it's a Sunday. You've got a week coming at a week ahead of you. I always make a point around having one thing in my diary every week that relates to some fun every week. Some of it could be cheap. It could just be like, I'm going to go to Greenwich park. Cause like the nice. weather, you know, the weather's going to be nice. I was going to take the blanket and just put, put it on the floor and just sit down and just like enjoy it. It's the, it's the intention behind it. Yeah. And, and they're looking us, forward. Yeah. And they're looking for exactly that anticipation. You're like, wow. Like recently I went and see, I saw a Dune part two. For me, I was really excited. I was like, yes, can't wait. The film. I'm like, yeah, Friday, man, get in there, sit down and watch the film. So I think a lot of life, whether you've got money or not, there is that joy you can still experience but a lot of it comes with that intention, that planning. It's like, okay, how do I use- And it stops you doing have. frivolous, as they would now say, dopamine inducing behaviors yeah. otherwise in the week. Cause you've got this light thing to look forward yeah. to. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like do book a holiday, you know, have something to look forward to, yes. you know. And I think that's so important because like, again, another reason why we talk about fi- financial joy is like two worlds coming together. That's why we use that, that phrase. The financial bit is that I want to become financially free. I want to become- financially independent. Everyone focuses and I was like, yeah, I want to make it. I want to look after my money. I want to grow my wealth, but they do it at the cost of their well-being. Yes. I love it. Okay. Without the well-being, forget don't, your wealth. Don't, don't call it's, it it's, financial, sensible, boring. Yeah, yeah, like you're, you're, you're basically without, without well-being, there's no, like, there's no enjoying the wealth. It's just pointless because a lot of people end up facing a lot of challenges, mental health problems, lots of stress, burnout. There's so many things that happen because they over-focus on one area at the cost of the other. 
But in actual fact, if you think about it, you could actually be with, you could be someone who only has, let's call it 200 quid in their bank account, but you could be at peace and actually enjoy your life more than someone who has 200,000 pounds. Oh, I think without a doubt. Although I do love the Arnold Schwarzenegger quote, uh, money doesn't bring happiness. I'm just as happy now I've got $60 million as when I had $40 million. (laughs) (laughs) And this is the book, man. This is your first book. Yes, this is it. And you wrote it it with your wife? Was that like like doing driving with someone giving the uh, GPS, (laughs) you know, or not the, uh, you know, the map? It was, it was, I've got to say, it was challenging trying to come with one voice in a book whilst also bringing in Did both Did one of you stories. write it mainly or? M- yeah, I, uh, we, we both contributed, but I led the writing process and she led review and, you know, it, you know, contributing other aspects, different stories. You know, I love as a, as a dyslexic practical. ADHD, it's broken up much more like a, uh, almost like a textbook that yeah. I could read. Well, it's a, it's a 10 week plan. So it's a right. week by week. So every week covers different areas. There's you, you begin at the start, almost defining what financial joy means to you, because it's different for everybody. What you define as financial joy will be different to what I define it as for me. And it's about how do you like that? I like that. It's, <laughs> it's, about, how, it's about how do you create that life for yourself? Because it'll be different for everybody, and it stops you comparing yourself. And this to other is what people. this bookmark is. It's, yes. a, it's a quiz. It's a quiz. So question one: I know and track my monthly expenses and income, and you've got to say between. I'm not doing this at all. Oh come on! Like, I'm all over this, man. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, nice. So you go that, and you get a you get a score. Yes, and it tells you you better read all of this book. Skip yeah. to chapter 12 yeah, yeah, or yeah, skip yeah. to chapter 12 chapter and you'll feel fine. Yeah, you'll be so, fine. Yeah, so the, the book is very practical and we've designed it that way so that single people and couples can, you know, couples can do it together. Single people can do it on their own if they want. But ultimately the idea being that over time you are achieving this balance of wealth and well-being, which is absolutely critical. So that over time you don't feel like I'm working all the time, but I'm not enjoying myself, I'm not prioritizing my health. I'm not prioritizing fun, but you're doing it intentionally. Even if you only have a thousand pounds in the bank, you're still finding a way to feel like, do you know what? I have I'm financial joy in my life. I'm in control. I'm progressing. I'm enjoying my life. I don't feel like so I'm- So many of us bury our yeah. head in the sand. Yes. And I mean, that, you know, why did they used to pay people in cash weekly? It was because people didn't have financial control. So it yeah. was just like this family hopefully wouldn't starve because it would be, you know, you give the money to the, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound sexist, but this is like years back, you know, the man would work, get given his money in cash. Sure. He, he, the danger was he blown in the pub on the way home, but he should give it to the missus and she'd hand him a tenner for the pub, you know, but yeah. if you went and blew it in the pub, it was weekly. Yeah. So you, it wasn't that long until you yeah, did it. Next week you'd have the income coming again. This is great, man. I mean, this is a really, I mean, is this something you, you're going to try and take to schools to, oh. Oh, well. so the, the, the vision festival is we're trying to get to the book. This is your festival. Yeah. Yeah. So we're trying to get the book out first of all in, well, festival in front of. Um, oh, the vision first of all. Yeah. Not festival. Yeah, exactly. I like yeah. festival too. <laughs> oh, no, festival the vision actually, festival's great. So we've, we've, well, we've got this idea of the financial joy festival that will come eventually one day, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but the current vision is getting the book pub- published, which is actually available now to pre-order Gives you authority everywhere. too, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. He wrote the book on it, that yes, line. Yes, yeah. So it's everywhere. Amazon, Waterstones, WH w. Smiths, all those places. Yeah. You can buy it, uh, buy the book. And we're actually, you know, who knows, you know, with all the support of everybody who has been following our work in May, you may, where, you know, who knows, it may even become a Sunday Times bestseller. This is our our dream, you know, to to get there one day, potentially. So once the book is out, for us, it's about seeing how people engage with the book. I want to be able to hear couples discussing, sitting down and saying, okay, we've gone through week one. Let's discuss as a couple talking about a single people doing the same things for themselves. That's why the book's very practical. You can write in it. You can yeah, reflect. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't pause to reflect, you know. So ultimately, firstly, we're trying to help, I'd call it, say, Every household in the country, we want them to experience a life of financial joy. That means a balanced, a balanced life of wealth and well-being. You know, I know people are struggling a lot with the cost of living crisis. There's so much going on in so many people's lives. Debt is a big problem for people, various households. A lot of people living on decent incomes are living paycheck to paycheck. People are trying to get on a property ladder. There's so many things that are going on and there's so much misinformation out there. So we want to, with the book, for example, with our work we're doing in different spaces, trying to effectively empower people to get into the driving seat of their own lives so that they can, you know, 
improve their relationship with money so that they can better handle money and steward that money better. For those who have children, they can teach their children how to do the same. So that ultimately over time, you can have households that are happy, able to, they feel confident that they know what they're doing with their finances. But they're also not only building wealth, but they're prioritizing their well-being. This is so key. You know, I don't know about you, but like post the pandemic, you know, the way, the way people look at life has changed. People want something slightly different now. They want to, you know, start to enjoy their lives a lot sooner. And I think that's absolutely key, you know. So how do you achieve all of that? So a big part of our work is empowering them to do it. I would be very interested in your perspective, especially someone come from a culture without a safety net, as you say, or, mm-hmm. or, or, or with uh, probably poverty on a level that, that is, is deeper and harder in Nigeria at a level that would be maybe, maybe even shocking to some extent to some people here. But do you think it's possible for everyone to have this? Like, or are you, you know, where do you think, you know, everyone's mm-hmm. like the government have clearly done a pretty mm-hmm. terrible job. And the, the crisis of the, the, you know, whether it be Brexit damaging the economy or whatever, mm-hmm. are you someone who sits in the camp of, well, don't be angry, sort it out? Or are you, are you, you know what I'm trying to ask? Or is it like for some people it's impossible and we have to change, fix society or, you know? I think, I think it's a, a mixture. There's, there has to be some intervention, most definitely from you know, the, the powers that be for sure. For example, I take, I for take some, an example. Or, you know, is in the, you're saying that there needs to be a safety net. Is that what oh, the mean? safety net's very, I think is, I personally think is very important, yeah. particularly if you're paying a load of taxes, which we are. <laughs> in any good conscience of society, yeah, I, think, I, think I think everyone would agree that who those who really can't look after themselves should be looked after. I think, I think a safety net's very important. You know, um, you know, I take the UK, for example, you know, we're, we're all paying loads of taxes. We're paying tax everywhere, whether it's VAT, yeah, income yeah. tax, corporation tax, everywhere you go, there's a tax being paid. As in a fellow accountant, yeah, exactly. are you stand up? Because everyone's like, oh, they need to tax, you know, everyone's getting away with that. I'm like, not anyone here, not in the UK. If they're yeah. foreigners or they move yeah, overseas, yeah, exactly. go for it. You yeah. know, you don't feel it. We, we're fucked. They're not here anymore. You know, not enough. Um but yeah, I mean, we're paying tax. There should be a sort of safety yeah, net. Yeah, I think, I think that's important. I think because, you know, people, life, it, people have different challenges. There are people who, you know, have been contributing for years and in different ways, and they suddenly have a, a life challenge, a health problem, or, you know, there are various things that happen that mean that, you know, they need that support. You know, they've been, you know, putting into the system in different ways. They need that support over time. Um, so I think a safety net's important, but I also think there's an aspect of, um, trying to employ your creativity to, that's why I think ent- being enterprising is very important. Is it, it's a sense of response, personal responsibility for your own finances. Is yeah, that oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. I think that's important. Don't otherwise- blame the government or blame for everyone. And I'm being unfair, but I'm just like, there's so much anger about, you know, there is so much anger and there's so many people really struggling. Yeah, and that anger, I can see where that anger comes from because like we're being dealt. There's so many blows yeah, coming from yeah. different aspects, you know, so many things and so many things that people are angry about because you're like, wait a sec, I'm struggling. There's like food banks everywhere. People are like struggling. But then you look around, there's like, you're like, well, why is in, you know, the money I'm paying into taxes and into various things? Why am I not feeling like I can see that money being used in my public services as well or in various areas? So people have the right to be angry in different ways. Uh, but I, I do think even in the anger, we need that personal responsibility. It needs to be that personal accountability over our finances. You need to be able to say, I make two grand and I'm not going to spend more than two grand. I'm going to live within my means. Yeah. That is, and I get that for some people, they have to exceed that because there are different challenges. What happens, it seems to be very hard when people's means increase. You know, it's the lowering your standard of living seems incredibly hard to do. And, and it is hard to do. And the thing about the, the, that whole idea of the lifestyle, it's effectively a lifestyle creep, is that it comes back to choices, you know, in the, every, and I know this is quite challenging, but every decision we make is a choice. You know, where you choose to live is a choice. What car you drive is a choice. Where you, you know, um, you know how much you're spending per week on takeaways is a choice. So I think, when you accept that, do you know what? You know, if I don't really look after my finances, the future could be quite difficult. Once one accepts that reality, then it's about how do I make choices that mean that every month I'm not making three grand and spending four grand. 
but I'm maybe making three grand and spending two grand. I'm really trying to defer gratification to a great extent and make choices that might be quite challenging and make sacrifices that are hard. But, I, you know, I'm finding a way to create a bit of, of a buffer that I can keep to create that you may, net. May, Maybe the, you discover there's a fallacy in that the other choice was going to make you happier or better or whatever. Do you know, it's life never that. never that predictable in some ways, you know. That you, I mean, there's some choices probably will always be bad, but... Some of them, yeah, may, may, may lead to other places, you know. Yeah, and some of those choices could be, for example, the, the reliance on, te- on things. You might think, okay, if I, if I buy this thing, this thing will make me happy or this thing will make me, there's this reliance on accumulating all the time. I think a helpful exercise is to look around your home and just think, imagine if you could see the pound signs for what each thing was worth. If you just looked around, just did a scan across your living room and you're like kitchen and like, you know, a lot of people's money is is effectively stored in things, yeah, in clutter, and the, yeah, and the and the fewer things you have, the more of your money you see. You know, this is the reality of life: is if you if you accumulate less things or fewer things, this is a great therapy session, by the way. No, you really <laughs> well, I'm helping just, I'm me. I'm just saying how it is. If you accumulate fewer things, it stresses you, you out. The clutter yeah, too you, it drags you, you have, down. You have more money. Like it is literally know, that. It's mind that's, just, that's just like. And I know it's quite hard to accept that no, simple but I like, reality. You, you but, that's know, just... but you're good at visualizing it. You're good at coming up with ways, you know, you did it with your son's story as well. So you're good at w- you're giving someone a simple way of looking. So, you know, the, if I look at everything, clutter drives my wife mad. We've got young kids running around. I'm, I've guaranteed to her that there is no person living as a minim- minimalist monk with a three and a four year old. And whatever yeah. she may believe, we will have lots of fucking toys everywhere. Yes, Having reality. said that, I don't help because I buy, and so does she, but I buy crap that, you know, gave you some joy. And if I stare at it, the money, but also as clutter, but also as, you know, it's all negative yeah. really for a moment of joy. Oh, I think I need this thing. Turns out I don't really need that thing. Yeah, and that's and that's and I guess this is where the I guess the the research around experiences for some people tends to have that much more la- longer lasting. Okay, joy. Put, put than, money into experiences. Yeah, so like He's having a know, meal, go to a theater, or have right. a meal, or you know, you know, have a staycation or whatever. You know, go out with your kids to you know a weekend away somewhere, something like a father and son or father and daughter type experience. Yeah. So it's different things that could create that longer lasting joy for people. But I've personally found, and because I've been through this, I've been through the whole spending all my money on in my twenties, buying a Rolex watch. And well, you were a, a CFO at a well, venture you capital. You yeah, must've done yeah, well there. Well, 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 having worked my way up, yes, you get paid well or paid decently, but you also pay loads of tax, but it comes back to after you've paid your tax and your income taxes, how much of that net income, this is where the difference is. So you have people, give an example, you might have somebody who makes, let's say, a hundred thousand right? pounds. Yep. You might think, yeah, they're doing really well. They're making a six figure income. Now. Wow. Yeah, life 50% must be, gone life must be good. But most of that money goes in taxes. In fact, as soon as they hit that level, they start losing their personal allowances, yep. right? And so they're God, not I love talking to accountants. <laughs> they're not quite as wealthy as you might think or as rich. Well, I think I was just thinking to myself, 100 grand is a great example. In shorthand, you know, you'd probably lose almost 50% of that in tax. Yeah, you, you lose two pounds for every one pound above Then everything that, you buy right? has got VAT. Yeah. So exactly. then you've lost another 20, 20%. So you're down to 40 grand now, you know, and, and you think, well, hundred grand, 40 grand divided by 12. It's not very yeah, much. There you go. So this is the reality. The question is, is you might have somebody on that level of income. Then you have somebody else who's on 50 K, right? Just an example, half the income, but that person on 50 K is, has made different choices. Like for example, they've not like moved, gone from there too bad to a four bad, They've not like, you know, subscribed to, I need to pay for my car finance, 400 pound a month. They've just bought a car cash because they just bought like one for nine grand or whatever. They're only paying and they're 20% tax. Yeah. And so they're paying they, a lower, exactly. They're so paying a lower I mean, they're, tax. They've got about 30, 35 grand. Well, there you go. So, so it's you only a little see, bit less. Yeah. And then you factor in the behavior element, which is that they just don't, you know, they just don't subscribe to keeping up, right? they will be a lot better off even though they're on half the income. Yeah. And they may get to their level of retirement one day a lot quicker because they're investing more of their money. And actually you may, you raise a really good point, which is something uh, vaguely in my, my world. So, you know, it, you, what is the Einstein thing that, you know, there are two marvels of the world and one of them is compound interest. interest. 
Mm-hmm. And you just start early. Yes. Kids, I know you don't care. If you happen to be early 20s or in your, whatever age, get on yeah, with no. it. You'd be amazed what putting away, you, you could look at this spreadsheet where they show, okay, if you want to end up with a million quid, say, yeah. How much would you have to put in if you started when you're 60, 50, 40, 30, yeah. 20? And the number goes down to like bugger all. It's insane. If you start early. It's funny. I did, um, I, I, was, <laughs> I think it was a TikTok I did or something. I, I was sharing how like if you invested 10 pounds a day, it's a 300 quid a month. And I know it's a lot of money for some people, but mm. I'm just using that as yeah, yeah. Simple relate numbers. to it, right? 10 quid a day. Um, if you saved it and didn't invest, like you just left it in an account, right? And you didn't invest it. It would take... 81, 83 years, I think the number is, to get to a million quid. You just kept saving right. it. But if you invested it, say at 8% return, average return, it takes about 41 years. Wow. Due to the compounding. So yeah, yeah. So it, it's interesting, even just, if, if I leave someone with that idea alone, yes, I know there are different moving parts and you know life will be challenged, but if you could commit to, I'm going to do 10 pounds a day, like Ken said, you know what, I'm going to do 300 quid a month. And I know it's hard for people. It's just weird. It's you know, just it's hard when you're young to imagine being old. And I, you know, we have a real problem as humans. I mean, I have it each oh, year I've with summer, and summer this. and winter. Yeah. I mean, it's winter still right now. I yeah. cannot imagine that those trees are going to have green leaves on them and mm. they're starting to come out. But you, know, you just can't imagine in London, it's been so shit this winter. I yeah, can't imagine. Man. It's never going to happen, June. The sun's never going to come out. And then in the summer, you're like, there's no way the winter's happening. Mm. You know, there's something odd about our amnesia or something, you know. Do you know what? This thing you said about it's hard to imagine being old as a young person. I I think we're missing something as a society. We take for granted the fact that there are older people in the country that we can learn from. Like if you're a 20 year old- Particularly in our culture. Yeah, man. If you're a 20 year old, I'd be speaking to someone in their 40s. Go and have a chat with them. If you're 40, go, oh. and, go and speak to someone in their 60s. Just go, go and show sit. your friends. It wouldn't look cool. But, you know, <laughs> no, but this is important because this is great advice. There, there's so much wisdom in the older, I say older population in, in what they've been through and so much we could learn from just sitting down. I never assume I know everything. I always go and speak to people like people in their 50s, 60s. I'm like listening. I'm like soaking up what they're saying. Because they carry so much wisdom, which is one thing that frustrates me actually speaking to businesses because there's this whole uh, ageism thing that's going on. So it's always been going on where like, if you look like in financial services, where I used to work, the industry, you go into the city, you just see young people. Yeah, they don't want to hire someone who's 60. Yeah, you don't see people. They'd be much better financial advisors. You don't see people in their 50s and late 50s, 60s. You just don't see them. And you think, wait, hang on a sec, what's You also happening? don't see enough women as financial advisors. We've been trying to get, we do financial advice. We've been trying to find a woman because we think they'd be much better advisors a lot of the time rather than the sort of the egotistical men thing, whatever yeah. it is. So this is, I think there's a missed opportunity. I heard of a company actually that does like a mentoring thing where they try and pair people like in their sixties, I think. With- well, the attitude is for a 20 year old is, oh, fucking tell me, I know, but that's almost... Have it, being the son of my dad when I came and worked here, that a lot of it is biology. I wouldn't even say it's that conscious. Like my dad, I respected him or whatever, but I could not help arguing with every single fucking word he said because yes. it's the young bull, the old bull. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm here to challenge the bull and yeah. start my own family. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm wired up this way. And even for a woman, I want to go, I want to get away from my family. I want to start a family. You know, I mean, you know, all of these things could be, uh, say that I'm saying the wrong thing. I'm sure if you chop them up, but you know, this, I, I wonder if it's not even, um, I guess a conscious decision. It's just that we're wired up. And for me at 45, what you said, I like, I appreciate the idea. I like the idea of talking to a 65 year old, but I think there's a big gap between a 20 year old doing that. Yeah. And they're the ones you almost need to tell most. Exactly. Because if they've missed, because talking about compound interest, for example, if you've missed, if you start missing that window from your twenties, right, it becomes harder because, you know, I use, use the example of Warren Buffett. I believe they said something like most of his wealth happened after the age of 50 or something like that, just because he'd started the investing. Curve. Yeah. yeah. He'd started investing many years ago, like yonks ago. So I always feel like pe- if you're a parent, for example, I know it's challenging, so hard for parents, you know, but opening that junior ISA or opening that junior SIP or whatever, 
you know, you get the rebate. If you put money into a junior set, you get, you know. The junior you know, ice is great. What is it, nine grand a year or something? Yeah, but the, max, the only yeah. problem with it is that they have to get the money when they're 18. 18. Yeah. Which, I mean, there's a sort of fudge, which you, they'll have your email address, but it's their money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you got to be careful yeah, with you that. Careful you're, with you're, that. you're on the line, yeah. you know. And back to your transparency point, I mean, I, if there was a lot of money there, I, I, I just think the law should be adapted for, and they sometimes do adapt it now. There's a second type of trust you can do now because, you know, 25 in my opinion, or 21, mm. 20, I mean, let's edge it down the road. Anyway, that's yeah, a detail. Yeah, I hear that. That is, that is a fair point. And I, I, I've got to, I've got to agree with that. That is, um, there is, there is a conflict there that some parents have, some parents even, I've had people say to me like, what if you like do all this stuff and your son or daughter ends up like super like, irresponsible like <laughs> what you can do? oh i mean we've seen it happen you know to, to a client um not the most pleasant man but you know he, he was a long-term um client of my old man's you know um anyway but yeah he had a, a trust that matured for his 18 year old kids mm. and it wrecked them i mean it, uh, textbook you know okay. i mean you know what do you do but um uh sorry sorry do say something oh no i was just gonna say that one thing i'm pra- we're practicing my wife and i'm pra- practicing is it's still no perfection yet, but practicing is trying to co-invest with our children to get them Ooh. involved in the process. On money day. Oh, yeah, not, not just money no, day, but just that's generally. Between like, misses, just yeah. generally, like, like, let's say, for example, I was going to buy in my son's junior ice, uh, the making up the S&P 500, for example, yeah. as an index fund. Just getting them to be part of the process. Oh, come and sit here, Josh. Like, here's the mouse. Do you mystify? Log in. Like, okay, so here is what we're about to do. So this thing's called a fund, and here are all these companies we're going to buy together. We're going to do it like it's shopping at Sainsbury's or yeah, Asda's yeah. online. We're going to add a hundred pounds that we got from your grandparents. We can see it there. We've gone to the bank and paid it in together. You know, we can now see it here. We can now use it to buy this fund. Yeah, and it's actually, and it's, it's, it's in, it, 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 there's no reason it's not as interesting as whatever other crap there is in life. Oh, yeah, because you're, you're really, because if you do that, you'd be surprised. Like the questions you get from children are astonishing. Yeah, astonishing. I had, I had my son once asking me what a loss means. So, for example, like if, you, if your stock goes down in value, he's like, does it mean that the bank took the money? Right. How do you explain the concept of a loss that's not crystallized to a child? I mean, that is so interesting because then it gives you that opportunity to just have that conversation. Well, you almost need like, to understand balance sheets yeah, or, you right. know, left, like, up and down. But then you've got to think like, how do I explain it? Imagine I, and a, a good way, uh, uh, a good way to explain that might be, imagine you've got a tree that, you know, in the summer blossoms, but during the autumn loses, loses the, the, the leaves and stuff, right? It's got that seasons. So the tree is still alive and well, a bit like your loss is not crystallized yet until you sell, right? But in the summer, in the good times, your stock comes back up, the tree blossoms again, okay. right? But when it's, you know, the autumn or whatever, the leaves oh, But it's fall still off, growing. But it's still growing. Yeah, I like it. Right? So that way, it's, you know, you're explaining it in a way a child can understand. This is it's why I think- It's shrunk, but it's it's not yeah, out because it's, it's out. a balance sheet. Yeah, it's not Unless dead. it's a yeah. negative balance sheet. Yeah. What do you feel out of interest on, do you do all your stuff on sort of platforms and do you use yeah. robots or do you, do you, do you like, you think financial advisors, uh, you should get a financial advisor? Where are you I, on that? I think some people have complex situations and they need advice. They'll just go and speak to, they have to speak to somebody, yeah. you know, to help them out or a financial coach or a, you know, a financial planner or whatever, someone who can, who can guide them. But what we're trying to do is empower people to work it out themselves. Work it. That's why the book's there. That's why the books are 10 week yeah, plan. Yeah. Okay, here you go. Here's everything step by step. So you can you can work out what you're doing, you know. I find the the, the real gift of financial advisor actually is the fact that procrastination is so much part of the problem. And we all have this sort of concept of, oh, I hear the stock market's down. I don't want to put my money in now. I, we, we, we sort of arrogantly want to make it, don't we? we want to do the Tesla decision or be in crypto. So we sort of fuck around with it. So I think the, 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 actually the reason you need a financial advisor is like you need a fitness trainer sometime. It's like, you know, they just say that just fucking, it's just, we're just going to do it. Again, yeah? it's accountability. If you think about it. Yes, I guess so. Cause they, they're kind of, they're kind of stopping you from number one, because there's always a cost of delay. I always tell people like, there's always a cost of delay. I, I, anyway, I, cost of delay, meaning the more you delay, the more yeah, it's costing. Yeah, the more you just faff around and yeah, go, yeah. oh yeah, 
I'm not going into the stock market because I'm like, oh, the thing's gone up, things gone down, things gone up. Yeah, and you're yeah. like, well, I'm not going to go in because I'm like, oh, I don't understand it. I yeah, don't know yeah. what I should do. But over 10 years, and you like, should 10 win. Years, yeah, 10 years goes by. I'm like, oh man, I wish I went in when I was 30. Yeah. <laughs> now I've just turned 40 and I'm like, I oh, thought man. it was bottom of the pit. It was no, like, you know, it was high at the it's market. It's the same thing. Same thing with the, I remember 2008, you know, the whole, you know, trying to get on the property ladder. Same thing. I remember all my friends saying, Nah, man, the world's falling apart. Don't go anywhere near the UK property. And yeah, yeah look at it now. You know, look, look at it since then, right? So it's the same thing. Assets go up over time. If you think long-term, particularly in a, you know, above normal inflationary environment, things tend to happen. Things tend to just go up. Give it time. Yeah, just give it time. But as long as the society doesn't fall. So what, come on, what have you buggered up? What's your biggest investment oh, or financial cock up? Co- other than telling uh, your me- wife mess everything. Ups, mess ups are a car, a very a flashy a nice car, car. What kind nice of car? It was a Mercedes Coupe. Nice. Back in, it was very nice. Had uh, nice rims. <laughs> Tires <laughs> pop easily, don't yeah, they? The, the, rims, you know, rims are the most yeah, pointless thing ever. Exactly. They make the car worse know, to drive. Then, they cost a fortune to replace. They pop really easily. But this is the thing about being a young person. I was in my 20s, right? I just yeah. wanted to look good, right? Yeah. You know, had the... Yeah, it's very Nigerian, out, actually. Oh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Culture. Rimmed, black rimmed ta- Black tower windows, you know, the subwoofers. It was just the thing. In fact, I could even start the car from my remote control. It was like, I had to do all of those things, right? Brilliant. You know, had the, the nice watch. You know, because I just, you know, it's just a stage of my life, right? And I actually quite enjoyed it. Yeah. But I didn't have very much money. Let's put it that way. You, it's, there's nothing like buying a nice car. If you, you're lucky enough to have that experience. It's a waste of money. But, it, you know, if you use a car a lot, you know. If you, it, do you know what? For some people, because I, I know of people who are at a stage in their lives where, look, they don't have any debts or whatever. They're just like, for them, the car's their thing. They just love having a nice car. And that's their thing. That's the thing yeah. that brings them joy. You know, do whatever. Well, you in joy. some culture, in, you know, slightly in Indian and other cultures, it, you almost will invest a lot in your car proportionally to, you know, see, it's a very important place, you know. Yeah, because a car is about status. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, yeah. And a society is really well, about Well, it's about status. getting A to B, but then there's, yeah, well, the, well, the, pra- then, then there's well, the status. Well, practically, yeah. like in my mind, it's just I want to get to wherever I want to get to in a car, yeah. get the bus or whatever. But culturally, a car says a lot about you. Like, you know, so mm. in, in say, I pick Nigerian culture. If you show up, if you're, if you're meant to be someone who, I don't know, is well-known or whatever, you'd be expected to have a well-known car. Mm. I'm just using that as a random example. No, like, no, it, it's it, a like pressure it, sometimes. A lot of famous musicians and stuff, they're bugger all money. And then they, you know, uh, and they have to uphold that perception, yeah. don't they? You know, and that is, that is the tragedy in all of this, because a lot of it is just keeping up with other people and keeping up with their expectations of you, mm. which speaks to self-awareness. A lot of people don't have any self-awareness. They know who they are. They know where they live. They know their names. But do they really know who they are. Oh. From a, well, that's the battle for inner, all of us, isn't it? In a, in a question. And actually, a, a, a money is an interesting lens to examine yourself through. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna fo- I am going to follow some of your advice because sometimes oh, my wife you. turns around and says like, yeah, I just feel, you know, you say it's okay that, you know, with the money, but I'm really frustrated and, you know, stressed about it and stuff. And it's like, we've done it once or twice, literally, you know, we're very close. So it's not a sort of big thing, but yeah, I'm going to start, I don't, I, yeah, like once a month, let's do, I, I, I can imagine it fun. I can I th- imagine I it quite so. sort of, you know, it, 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 it'll sort your head out a little bit. I really you know, do. Because you're in it together, you know, I, 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 I yeah. I did a, um, we once did a thing where we, we did a, a talk to couples, about a hundred couples. We had a, like a couple, um, a couples event, right? A uh, hundred couples. And we, we asked them a question. It was the first time, believe it or not the couples actually sat down next to each other and talked about what's going on. I'm not surprised. Because we asked them to do it. Like literally, imagine like you're like, I'm going to put my- Did did anyone storm out? Oh, no, no, no. But it was very enlightening. Because we asked them like, how did you find this experience? And people were like, wow, like, you know, we actually opened up and talked. Whereas when you're at home with your partner, you know- you're yeah, usually like, oh, babe, should we just watch like Netflix? Yeah. What's that show we're going to watch? You're always wanting something to engage with, but not engage with yeah, each other yeah, yeah. in it's conversation. So it's the sort of sitting opposite each other. Uh, I think you've given a lot of good advice. I mean, we, we like to ask what's the best advice you were ever given. Is that, is that? So for me, it was don't rely on just your salary. Ooh. Find an alternative source of income. Good advice. What's I came it? from my mum. 
Wow. Yeah, man. It's just, just like, just like, you know, this job you're doing as an accountant is great. It's good for your LinkedIn, but you need other sources of income. <laughs> Have more than one string to your bow, basically. Yeah, you need something else. You need, like, you know, use your talents or your skills in a different way. Offer consultancy. Well, there's a nice Offer, one. You know, You've created a, a long-term object that yes. hopefully will generate income and help people, you know. Yeah, this will really help people, which is a, a great thing. And obviously create, you know, sales and what have you. So, yeah. Worst advice? Ooh, tough one. I would say that your career will carry on and you will always earn money. So that it'll, it, you know, it'll it, it will all carry, it will always carry on on a straight line. It, it just never, it never really does. If you think you've got 10 years or 15 years, let's say, if you think you've got 20 years in your career, make it 10 years, assume it's 10 years. Yeah. Because life just happens. Life people really have fucking health, does. People have health, health. problems. Like Get life th insurance. Things, yeah, thank you. Things happen. If you can, I know this is, this will yeah. become more of a privilege actually. H health insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Get it young insurance. when you're healthy. Get it young whilst you can. You know, because I've just, look, man, people are like, oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in my thirties. Yeah, I'll keep working till I'm in my fifties, sixties. Nah, man. Like things will happen. Suddenly you go, there's this diagnosis. Suddenly life No, I changes. lost my sis last year. I saw it. You, you, know, you know, and it's so oh, true. And actually the stats are really humbling. Again, when you look at what is the chance of you being off work for six months, dying long term. And it's like, no, we're really, we're really like, don't, I don't know what it is, whether it's the sort of candy coated Americanized, Brit, I don't know, Western thing we've grown up in that you get three score and 10 and, you know, with mm. the health system will keep you alive. And it's a real expectation now, but I always think the best thing to do, walk around a graveyard. You walk you around a what? graveyard and it's like 40, 30, 20, 12. Last you know. one I saw was 32. Yeah. You know, I lost my, and talk about this, I lost my brother, my sister's husband who we have, we have exactly the same date of birth. Lost wow. him last year, 39, oh, I'm sorry. 39 cancer. years old. Cancer. Yeah, yeah. pancreatic? Th no. No, uh, lung cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. 39 years old, never smoked. You know, Boom. so so when you see stuff like that, you know, I, I, I think for some people, yeah, you need to get to a point of no return in your life. It could be, for some people it's redundancy. Some people is divorced. For some people is losing somebody. Some people is like a health thing, like a diagnosis. I feel like people need something that acts as a slap in the face event that literally just stops them in their tracks and they suddenly wake up and yeah. realize, you know what? I kind of need to start to do something different well, in my life. You know? I mean, his gift is the wrong word, but you know, that's the... <laughs> you know, things happen and things aren't good or bad, but good or bad things are about it, you know, and someone dying like that. Yeah. You pick up some of their good spirit, you know, and you learn some things about the fragility. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sorry, man. Yeah. Uh, what, what, um, and, and finally, before we get on to the, uh, far, far, fast, uh, <laughs> friendly, fun endings of this, uh, 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 shenanigans, is, is there anything you think is bullshit in your industry? And I'm, well, you're in a few industries, mm. so you could take a pick. But maybe anything you just think is real bullshit. I guess, it, actually, you know what your industry is? It's that whole financial advice kind of thing. And there's a lot of people talking bollocks out there, I think. Oh, I was just it's funny. I, the one thing I'd say is the fact that there are, there's so many, there's so much advice out there that you don't know what to believe anymore. There's a lot of mm. misinformation. I think the misinformation and the fact that you can, like you, there are people who are not qualified to say anything. Well, actually I'll, be, I'll give you a confession. I remember when D sent me, it was a while ago and I said, like, I fucking hate this area, man. There's all the, every time I look these people up who are giving advice about how to make yeah, money, yeah, I, yeah, I'm an accountant yeah, yeah, like yeah. you. I go on company's house. I yeah, look yeah, them yeah, up yeah, and yeah. I'm like, none of they, this guy doesn't have any companies. He's never <laughs> built a business and the companies he has a bust. <laughs> and like, he's just a man making a bit of money on YouTube telling, it's like the famous cartoon of the picture of the, the tramp selling the picture of how to make a million. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, well, why? And you read the book, man. Yeah. You know, I, you know, yeah. it doesn't make sense. So, and then I checked you out, you know, and looked you up and whatever. And, you know, I, you know, obviously you're a fellow accountant or something, but I remember saying to D like, I don't, I, and I, I don't know if this is the wrong thing to say, but I was like, I don't really want lots of people like, like of this world mm. on this podcast, but mm. these people look great. Mm. And I think, I think it's been brilliant what you've said, you know? Thank and you. I think, I think as always in life, that's the sad thing, isn't it? So much fucking noise. There's a lot of noise. And There's trying to of... find the signal. A lot you know. of misinformation. A lot of people are being led astray. A lot of people are. The get rich so quick much. thing pisses oh, me huge. off. It's huge. It's huge. And it's everywhere. And, and, and sadly, it's addictive. The, the, the rules and the law, and, you know, like people get scammed all the time. So many things happening. People are losing their money. And 
it's for me, it's very sad actually to see that because like people don't know who to trust. You know, it's just like, wow, this that person said that on TikTok, that person said that on Instagram, that person said that on LinkedIn, that person said that on YouTube. There's so many people yeah, saying yeah. so much. It's like, whew, who do you listen to? Who do you well, trust? And, I, you you luck, luckily, um, and again, why I like podcasts and stuff, but we're not bad at spotting honesty. And I think more and more what the people who really, and I've, you know, I think you already have, and you'll continue to break through and stuff because people pick up on honesty and people pick up on integrity. 100%. As long as they're presented to it, in 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 a in a um, unedited form. Yes, it's the editing that fucks everything up. You can yeah. make a, a a hero, a criminal, a criminal, a hero, and so you know that's the sort of you know I don't know. You're doing you're building the foundations of look. Mm-hmm. Let's sit down and do the hard work yeah. and write the book. Yeah. I mean, it's all hard work, isn't yeah. it? But I hope you know that YouTube. Is, therefore, people gravitate towards truth if they can gravitate towards a, a slightly longer form. I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're trying to say. Because but there's like this culture which is clashing with what we're saying here which is this culture of this instant gratification which is like watch this 15 second clip watch this like 30 second thing and people are like wanting instant we said somebody listen to a podcast like these guys have had a really great conversation okay it's an hour long but it people will don't want to put in the time they don't, they don't want to do that they don't want to do that. Bit, which you then think, if you can't listen to a one hour yeah, podcast- Yeah, we'll watch fucking 27 like, yeah. op- episodes Thank on you. Netflix. Thank you. Some- like if you, can't, if you can't even do that, how on earth are you going to look after your finances? Like, and then don't be angry. Yeah. I know that's yeah. maybe slightly unfair, but I get, I get, I get to that end of the scale. If, 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 if you're, if you're suffering and you're trying hard, I really feel for you. But if you're suffering and you're not trying hard, then that's a much more complicated place. You know, I tell people all the time, wealth building is about doing admin. Like if you can't, yeah. do, if you can't do spreadsheets, admin, baby. Yeah. Like if you can't do admin, forget about it. <laughs> you're, you're literally going to struggle. Like, There's I people get, on their I own right now going up. I know, but it's, I know it's not going to be popular, but it's the reality. Life is about life. admin, isn't it? Yeah, of course life it is. is it's admin. like, have you phoned this company to oh, check? Man. Have you phoned to try and get a better deal on your car insurance? Have you called? The to money try and saving get expert has done a lot. Do you, do you yes. respect? I mean, I think it's brilliant what he's done. What's his name? Michael. Mart- Martin, Martin Lewis. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's apps. I mean, his first move. His website's in this good. Place. I read it as an accountant and I'm always like, well, he's basically right. You it's, know, the bits I know about. And he's, and he's highly respected because he's very transparent and he is authoritative and he really cares about what he teaches people. So for me, seeing that is, I, I like that. It's like inspiring to see that. Yeah. Like, well, wow. I think he's you a know, signal. Is, he's a signal out there that people have tapped into. Ken, you've been absolutely brilliant. We can talk for hours, but we've got to, <laughs> before my producer sort of like just cuts me <laughs> off and the microphone stop working, we've got to do the end bit of the show, which is the fun sure. bit. So Go on then. quick far round. We're going to ask you a few quick questions okay. and you've just got to ask them quickly. You should know the answers. Go on, um, then. Let's queuing some music. There it is. Oh, okay. Okay. What was your first job? A cleaner in a paper factory in East London. Nice. What was, well, maybe not nice. <laughs> Don't know. Uh, a lot of paper. What was your worst job? Uh, an animal technician. I'd open these boxes with like 30 mice in them and I'd have to clean out all their poo and stuff. It was terrible. Wow. Yeah, How old were you? Yeah. I was 16. Yeah. Oh, mouse poo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's worse than rat poo. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite subject at school? Maths and chemistry. Maths and chemistry. What's your special skill? I'm able to explain complex things in a simple way. You are, with imagery. <laughs> uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? I didn't know what I wanted to be. No idea. I just, I just, co- I just coasted along. Yeah, okay. If I'm honest. Yeah. Okay, you, yeah. you didn't find school too difficult? I kind of just, no, not too difficult. I had to work hard, but I didn't know what I wanted. No, it was just does? like yeah. Yeah, I think work out what you don't want. Um, you don't want to work cleaning mouse poo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What did your parents want you to be? A doctor. Oh, good. My dad's solid. a vet. Oh, is he? Well, he that's where as, the money is. He tra- he, well, he trained as a vet, but came to the UK and, and it was completely it. worthless. And couldn't, and couldn't, couldn't uh, really trans- use it. Yeah. Oh, it's bollocks. Cause yeah, you pre- yeah, would have yeah. trained as basically a British vet. Yeah, exactly. My wife is a doctor who trained in Trinidad and there was a university, university of West Indies. And you could train there and right. go immediately into the British system. Interesting. And they closed, they closed the door oh, 10 years. Well. She was the last year, but that's the way it should be. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, uh, what's your go-to karaoke song? I'm going to go way back to my old days when way I was back. 20 something. I'd say kiss from a rose by seal. Ooh, he can sing, man. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, office dogs, business or bullshit? Where's my, where's my furry friend? Could I, could I say both? 
You, no, you can answer? say bullshit. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm going to get offended. <laughs> I probably agree with you, but he's my brother, and and this especially said, since I lost my sister, I'm like fuck uh, this. He's go. going everywhere. This is what me. I said, both. I think I think I think there's uh, the culture of having dogs in the office. There's definitely a place for it, but you could also see why it's bullshit as well. Brings a lot of joy. Brings a lot of joy. But maybe not that yeah. much finance. <laughs> Costs a lot, from what I hear. So, oh my god. Maybe you can tell me. <laughs> Dane, da- we were talking about this yesterday. How we 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 get this cuddly thing and then feed it dead cuddly things, you know, uh, like, oh, it's rabbit and uh, <laughs> lambs chopped up for my cuddly little dog. Cause I love animals. It's uh, fucking ironic. Uh, have you ever been fired? Yes. Made redundant in 2008 post uh, uh, global, global financial crisis. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, Is yeah. that the start of this? Is that well, was no, it? this started in 2017. Oh yeah. Much yeah, later. Yeah, Sorry. Much later, I still think later. I'm in 2012. Don't you? <laughs> I find it upsetting. And uh, what's your vice? Oh, dark chocolate. Oh, yeah, I love, yeah, good. a bit of green and blacks or whatever. Yeah, I like some of those. That's, uh, <laughs> is Nigeria famous for chocolate at all? No, that's more like uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. They're, okay. they're much more... Nearby, known. but no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> top tips for... Well, you've got all these top tips for founders and entrepreneurs? Or? Oh, it's quite a few. I can tick. Okay, great. Of, so yeah, let's have it. First one is... Focus on purpose over profits. Very important. And this is a difficult balance for a lot of entrepreneurs, but it will lead you further, I think. Purpose more important purpose, than profits. Definitely. Don't get too, 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 too lost. People would often argue the opposite. Well, profits are important, but without the purpose, you lose the soul for why you're doing it. So I think it's very- And it's going to get hard. Very, yeah. So even when it gets hard, if you get the purpose, it keeps you going. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. Second is create a, if you can, create a subscription element to your business. Because subs- subscribers are worth more than customers. Annual recurring revenue. Yeah, that's what you want. You want an element of what you're doing to be subscription-based because it, it, it actually creates more value for your business. You've got lifetime value. Uh, third Spot one on. would be um, focus on understanding who you're serving and why. Who are you... Like who are you trying to help and why? What is true marketing that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. Because if you, cause if you don't understand that, you're always chasing your tail. You're like always dancing around. But if you understand that, you understand the avatar of your ideal customer, you're able to serve them deeper and better than that, you're able to advocate for them. Because mm. advocacy is where people, like if you advocate- okay, you, Advocate you, means represent them. Yeah, you're like you're fighting for what matters to them. Yeah. Like you're, you're deep in the trenches and like, I find a lot of people relate to our stuff well, because we've got to advocacy level, which is like, what do these people, what are their pain points? What do they worry about? And then it leads to then what I'd, I'd call conversation domination, where you're actually, oh, God. you're actually everything they worry about, everything they care about, you are talking about. Because if you dominate in those conversations, in those keywords, everywhere anyone searches for that, you show up. It's hard to work out who your customer is sometimes. No, but you have to begin from the very beginning because it comes back to why are you doing what you're doing? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Right. Because if you don't understand that, then you're- That should lead to who's the market for. Well, exactly. I'm trying to help old ladies do X. Yeah, because there's that that saying, you know, he or she who speaks to everyone speaks to no one, right? So if you're speaking to everyone, then it's like, yeah, like- you're just everywhere, which is pointless. But if you're like, you know what? I'm trying to serve, this is the problem I'm trying to solve for this type of person. Then it becomes about them and you- Yeah, and customers to- love it when it's specific. I mean, yeah. when we buy something, we go to a website yeah. and when they literally talk to us, we're like, this is the product yeah. I yeah. wanted. Exactly. You know? You're speaking to a particular need. I think that's important. I mean, I always uh, bless, bless, bless him. Um, Paul, I've mentioned the Indians. So when we take, we help Indian businesses come in and it's okay. much rarer now, but 10 years ago, I'd often meet an Indian business and you'd look up their website and it, they would do everything. When I mean everything, it'd be like, you know, we sell bananas, we build software yeah. and, you know, and there'd be this like, it's like, crazy selection of shit on the website and you'd be like and then, oh, we do everything you know and that's a very Indian yes isn't yeah. it you know yeah. I'm very capable yeah, whatever yeah. you need Andrew and it's we've like got I'm it. so we've confused as an advisor I'm like yeah but which bit of your multinational yeah. multinational yeah. conglomerate yeah. <laughs> that you and your wife run yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> seeking to ex- anyway yeah. god I've upset everyone I'm sure but anyway <laughs> and uh, are they were brilliant tips anymore was that was that the yeah and I also think a lot of, a lot of uh, small business Businesses, SMEs, for example, are missing out on content as a way to really reach new audiences. You could attract people globally through your content. I get people who bump into me who like, they feel like they know us, 
They not only like us, but they trust us because of the content. We've never met before, but because we're you've speaking to- tr- you built trust through your honesty. You know. Thank you. Through the transparency, through the honesty, through yeah. the authenticity. I think this is a, miss, a massive missing piece for business owners is how do you use your smartphone to speak to the problems that your ideal customer is facing? How do you do it in a relatable way? How do you use today? How do you use LinkedIn? You know, on LinkedIn, everyone's like showing off their yeah. I'm partner, I'm C level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all like BS, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> when, yes. they, when you actual fact, if you think about it, like LinkedIn, for example, I'm just using, they're trying to turn their platform into a creator platform. It's a massive opportunity for business owners. Like if, if a business owner is smart, you would leverage that now and you know, the algorithm works yeah, like Yeah, we we're starting on, to look to use it more because it, I, like, I like it that it's a world of business. Yes. And that I like that we all have to have, like private lives are private lives, but, you know, a bit like some people might put on their suit and they say, I'm putting on my armor. Mm. You know, it's like, it, you know, you have to have a professional side, assuming yes. you're going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you allow people into. Yeah. And and therefore I like LinkedIn. And I agree with this. A lot of BS starts creeping into it. It's very personal stuff again. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, very good. Uh, any recommendations of anything to read, watch, listen to? Do you know what? In terms of what to watch, I watched a documentary called 14 Peaks. Ooh. So it's about this guy called Nims, Nims Perger. Uh, ne- ne- I can never say the word. <sighs> I wouldn't ne- try ne- that Nepali name. British mountaineer. Wow. Um, actually, a feature story in our book. But this guy summited the, the tallest mountains in the world above 8,000 feet. Not Britain. In in seven months. Wow. 14 of them in seven months. Before that, the previous person done it in seven years. This guy is, you just go and watch it. It's on Netflix. Sure. You go, what do you like about it so much? Oh gosh, because this idea, he created this thing called Project Possible, where oh. he, he was trying to prove that nothing is impossible in life. But better than that, this is where purpose comes in. Him summiting all those mountains was really about trying to spotlight the local Sherpas, the people who actually help other people, you know, summit these mountains, but don't get the credit. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So for him, it wasn't just about him and what he's going to get out of it and whatever. It's about how do I spotlight these people? And I think a lot of business owners can take, yeah. you can take a lot away from now, which is like, you know, that's why I speak about purpose a lot. It's like, this is important. Like what is the, what is like, what is your why for what you're doing? What's the why for the business? That's why I particularly like that. I've watched that documentary so many times, man. Like, I, I love that. I mean, it's almost so a Monty inspiring. Python element to the, the the people on the top. Like, hey, we climbed Everest, yeah. and behind them is all the people. Like, thank you, carrying carrying all their gear, <laughs> and like, fucking, you know, they wouldn't have got there with it. setting up it, camp. Yeah, you it's know. like it's like you know, like business CEOs, entrepreneurs. You know, for them, it might be all about them, but then they forget that That's their teams got their teams got them there. And I did the wrong thing there too. That I went. The attitude will be, oh, well, they live here. They're adapted to it. You know, they, you know, and there'll be an element of that. You know, it takes a while to get your oxygen levels up. But yeah, it did, we discredit them because it, we can't even take in what they do. You yeah, know? yeah. And this is why I, I you know, can't for imagine me, that. That's your job, climbing Everest. What, what do you do for a living? I climb Everest. Yeah, I climb Everest. Yeah. I, cl- I carry rich people's I, shit up a fucking yeah. hill. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. what do you do? I'm an accountant. <laughs> when they, yeah. God damn it. Actually, one of my first jobs was working on a farm. And that's when I was like, I want to work inside on a chair. That was my first realization when I was like 16. I was like, this is what I have decided. You know, when my hands swelled up from coriander, don't pick coriander. Fucking nightmare, that stuff is. You'd have no idea just picking coriander. She hates coriander. Oh, and your fucking hands are like, and they're like, you didn't wear your gloves today? And I was like, you know, I I didn't understand I'd be crippled for life. It's coriander, not like nuclear waste. Anyway, uh, very good. That's it. Now we're on the end of the show. Sure. Uh, that brings us to our favorite part of the show, business or bullshit. I'm going to reel off some terms Go on, then. and you're going to tell me whether you think they are business or bullshit. Go on, then. I might challenge or we might elaborate. We okay. might we might chuck some of these away if we think they're terribly dull, dull and we don't know what to do with it. Right. Uh, burn rate. Burn rate. Oh. That's the amount you spend on a monthly basis in a company. It's kind of a shit question, to be honest, but you know. I'd say business. Yeah. I guess it's life. Yeah. It's just, it's just it's, yeah. You need, to, you need to kind of have an idea of that. Yeah. I think that's going to be, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I think this is saying, oh yeah. Private equity, PE. <laughs> I'm going to upset you're some people. You're a VC, pe- I'm right? Gonna, I'm going to upset some people. Yeah. Go I on. mean, there's a, there's a place for it, but 
I think it's, it's overhyped, hyped massively. What, when I say private equity, how would you describe private equity? What is that? It's just basically taking money and investing in companies and maxing out and making five times your money back or however much over a period and of time. And overhyped is in it's, it's held out to be a good thing? Well, it's held out to be, um, in, in many ways, maybe the only option for certain businesses as a way to finance their companies and grow and what have you. When in actual fact, there are other ways to finance your company. There are other ways to... Grow your grow business, things. grow your thing, grow your business over time. Not everybody needs. Did you, you think know, the VC you worked at was uh, uh well, it was Edge Investments? Was it a VC? Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were doing they were doing investing in the creative industries, which I thought was actually quite good because he was oh, focused cool. on a particular area. Movies or music? Uh, various things, you know, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality, you know, all those things, uh, AI and various things, but in the creatives creative industry. So yeah. tech enabled things and so uh, you just kind of feel all those things. Don't feel it's your only option. But this is the only this is yeah, for me it's about letting people know their options and also just being aware that like it's not the only game in town. Yes, there's a place for it and that helps, you know, fast growing businesses to really scale up potentially, potentially. Uh but it's not the only game. People People grow their businesses without raising money. People seek other forms of financing to grow their business. But I don't think people know. There's grant funding. There's different things people can do. There's ways to grow yeah, their businesses. Yeah. But not everybody knows that. But there are certain businesses that have a need for venture capital and they, you know, they can raise money and do what they need to do. Very good. Um, intrapreneurship, which I think... Do you know what? I think that's actually pretty important. That's business. Okay. Because I say that because you can be an employee... But if you are enterprising, you can make a lot of money from your actual job. I used to know some guys real quick who they'd make like 5K a month in net income, brilliant income. But from being entrepreneurs, they'd make like 20K on commissions a month. Wow. Which is insane when you think about it. So they'd, they'd go and bring clients. I used to work in prime brokerage. They'd go and bring clients in and then they'd share a part of the revenue from bringing in. That's entrepreneurship. So they're actually making a lot of money within. Yeah, I guess it's it's uh, use bend it to your will would be the old phrase. You're in a job, you're in a system. Yeah, you know you can you. It doesn't mean you've got to leave it to be an entrepreneur. Look at the no, system. No, no, it's about look using, at the commission or whatever you yeah, can it's about do. Using what you have in your hands, really. Yeah. Ah, <sighs> go on. Let's internal see. meetings. Internal I think, meetings. I think it's BS, man. <laughs> You, you and your wife, you and your wife have a lot of internal meetings. No, no, but I just think from a corporate perspective, oh my I, God. Do you know, do you know my how much diary I hate? is fucking. Do you know how much I hate? Like you look at your calendar. Do you know my best? Do you know my it's best day? Though. My best days when I look at my calendar, there's nothing in there. Oh, you bastard! It's just literally like there's no meetings. I'm like, yes, yeah, that I can actually it. do something. Yeah, yeah, you're making me. I'd love to have a day when I don't have any meeting. Um, do you know, uh, reverse vesting? So getting shares and then people buying them back. Uh, oh God, this is a bit sounds, technical. This is like, a bit technical. Yeah. Um, guerrilla marketing. Like, is this literally like using, no, it's doing something outrageous to draw attention. Oh God. I, so you, you, you and the wife, you know, going naked on the news or something to, you oh, know, uh, you that's go interesting. viral or whatever. Well, do you know what? I think. I think you could, I think that speaks to creativity, to be honest. I'd probably say mm, in between. I like a bit of guerrilla marketing. Music industry is full of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know. I'd, 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 I'd say You could glue you yourself to the Bank of England say, for 24 yeah. hours. You'd probably <laughs> get your book in the bestsellers. <laughs> you, you, you and the wife would be like, oh, it's a oh, fucking no. stupid idea, this one. <laughs> it could backfire it as well. Could backfire. You know, like, so, your yeah, kids you would love careful. it. They'd come and throw things at you. Uh, health and safety. Oh, sorry. Health and safety. Health and safety. Health and safety is important. Oh, come on. I think it's important. Health and safety go mad. But it can go crazy, man. Do you know what that card should say? Regulation, which I think you need a bit of, but we have lost too much fucking. Yeah, too much. Yeah. We're not moving forward. More regulation isn't making anything better. It's not, I mean, no. we could do it as accountants. Oh, you know what? We need more notes in the accounts. I hear now that you go and get a report from a company. It's a hundred pages on more audit standards, more this, more that. And, and, and the stats, I saw it the other day. Nobody fucking reads them because yeah. it's a hundred pages. Yeah, no if it was cares. three pages, they download, I'd read it. They, they don't open it. Uh, golden handshake being paid a, a large sum of money to come in the door. I hate Come-chance. that, man. It's just, yeah. Provocative. 
sort of stuff that happens. We'll do a few more. Um, I don't know what this is. Sales funnel modeling. Do you know what oh, I mean? sales funnel is a business. Okay. What's sales what funnel modeling? Uh, well, modeling. I don't know what the modeling bit is, but sales yeah. funnels. Yeah. That's just finding ways to get income in a business. Well, that's just creating a process for to to move a lead to a conversion, basically. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's business. Insurance. Insurance is business. Yeah. Listen, you can't have too much insurance, particularly in people's personal finances. Like, if you're underinsured, think about it. If you build all that wealth and you're not protecting it, like, that's I think the thing I learned man. from losing, we've lost three partners, but we learn it. The second partner, we lost one at 36, then I went at 39, then my sister at 47, all in the last know, five, seven years. It's <laughs> yeah. been rough. But because the second one died without insurance, my sister went and got loads of life insurance. And, and my dad's always banged on it about our whole life yep. is that- it's cheap. If the worst comes, it's very cheap. Yeah. And and if you're thinking to yourself out there, I can't afford it. Honestly, you can you can pay for what you can afford. If you can afford ten pound a month, you That's can it. afford life insurance. You know. Yeah. And that you can't replace this. Very sadly, in this music group I'm in, this quite well known guy who was a graphic designer died and lucky and and people have been raising money for him and I and I've been meaning to send this message that I'm like, look. You know, and people raise 10, 12 grand for his, you know, great for his widow, but it's wow. fucking nothing. You know wow. what I mean? It's not, it got, it's the, it, it, life insurance is the only way you can potentially you know have enough money to protect a family. This is, you know, this topic is huge. It's what you're huge. just talking about, like, because I just think there's no point, and we talk about this even in the, in the black community, where it's like someone passes away, people haven't like prepared. Everyone's doing yeah, this. Yeah, he was black. Everyone's, doing, every, yeah. everyone's doing these GoFundMe. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's exactly like, oh, this. Please chip in 20 quid. Yeah, chip yeah, in, yeah. You know, yeah. And I think that's just like us, we're just, we're just not being like, like death. And it's a, you know, it's a everyone's tricky topic. Like everyone's this though. everyone's it's, black yeah, or white, you're black or white it's going to happen, but it's inevitable. I think yeah, no yeah. matter your culture, no matter where you're from, these GoFundMe's need to go. Yeah, like yeah. we need to start to prepare, speak to your siblings, like start to put money in a, in a, in a kitty together, joint accounts together, prepare, yeah, do funeral plan, do your insurance. life insurance, man. Yeah, yeah. You need that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, actually, I've been battling, you know, financial advice. It was interesting, the financial advisors here showing me the list of organizing your finances. And I, I think it'd be really brilliant if, um, you know, we, we, we maybe even followed up and, 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 and took you on some, for some mm. consultancy, but separate chat. And number five was life insurance, was called protection. Yeah. Number two was build up um, 20, 30, you know, build up yeah, a reserve yeah, fund. Yeah. And I was like... Look, I'm not going to get to fucking number five. Mm. I'm going to get number one is like pay off on my high interest. Just get rid of my credit card. Number yeah, two, yeah, build it. Yeah. And it's like, and I've managed to persuade. I'm like, can we just start with mm. go and buy some fucking life insurance? And then, wow. and then number two, let's start sorting all that other stuff out because next week I might find out that I got cancer. Do you know, and you can't, that's and it. It's, gone. it's too late. And if it, you're telling me I've got to get, nobody's going to get 10 grand in the bank. That's hard. You've done it. It's fucking hard. Do you hard. know what I said to you? There's always a cost to delay. This is a good example. Yeah, of that. that is a good example. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I'll do this later. Pfft, no, no, you're not. All right, we'll yeah. do a couple more. Breakfast meetings. I hate breakfast I, meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Agreed. Uh, um, let's just see what we got. Um, okay, we'll do we'll do these three. Uh, bridging rounds. It's when you're getting money to bridge you between different things. I mean, it's it's business, I guess. Shit. It's like it is business, like if you're buying investment yeah, property or whatever, you can do. We don't like that one. Uh, bootstrapped and funding yourself. That is definitely business. That's almost what you were about. Do you know what? That's what I do, man. Like, I mean, I've, I, I know all those funding rounds exist and those sort of things, but I just haven't needed to do that because I, you know. That's your kind of message, actually. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. anything I'm saying, it's like independence. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. And do, do, yeah, your, do, yeah. do your P&L. Uh, and last one, sophisticated investors. This is a concept that pe you can't offer investments unless they're sophisticated. <laughs> you know what I'm talking I, about? I, yeah. I just think it's just BS, man. I, I think people should, have, obviously there are people who are very, a lot more knowledgeable than other people, which I guess is the people you call sophisticated. So they do complex things like venture capital trusts and EISs. And those are all good things to do. But I just think that I think over time people should learn to manage their own money, you know, and, you know, get into the driving seat. It doesn't need to be sophisticated. It's sophisticated just to be is uh, to end on something that mystifies it again, doesn't yeah. it? 
It yeah. makes it so I'm, you know, I'm sophisticated. Yeah, you know, I've got this uh, degree, about, and I know yeah. what I'm talking about. And actually, it's, it, it's again not only with your principles of demystifying. It should be it. simple. Should be simple. Should be simple. Ken, you've been an absolute pleasure. So uh, you've written this book. Do you want to give us thirty seconds yeah. on why you know go get it yeah. or so your plug? Fi- so financial joy is what's a, the matter? Uh, oh, you yes, are the judge. Yes, let me do that. Okay, so Financial Joy is a 10-week plan to help you banish debt, grow your money, and unlock financial freedom. So it's a plan, so it's 10 weeks. It's got week one, you begin to design your life with financial joy, then work through your relationship with money, go through the process of becoming debt-free, then you start to look at day-to-day finances. Then you learn to invest, very important. Doing it with your partner if you've got one, you can do it by yourself if you're single. But this book is about helping us to change our relationship with money. But ultimately, this book... We want this book to help people ultimately become financially free, but balance that with well-being, have your fun, you know, all those things. So this book will be a game. I, I honestly believe like this book will be a game changer for people and people should, if they did what was in this, if they do what's in this book, it will completely transform their, their finances, not just for themselves, but also for their children if they've got, if they've got any. So go get Financial Joy everywhere, Amazon, Waterstones, W.H. Smiths, buy one for somebody else as a gift, get it out there. But more than, more importantly, do the plan. And it's available on Audible as well in our own voices, which is just brilliant. So yeah. Ken, it's been an absolute delight. Um, and sorry to not meet Mary, but uh, ne- next she time. She sends her love. Yeah. She sends her love. Yeah. Yeah. And my mum's a Mary. And Mary's always <laughs> a good name. Uh, so there you have it. That was this week's episode of Business Without Bullshit. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. Thank you, Romeo. You've been excellently behaved as usual. Uh, we'll be back with our quiz, Business or Bullshit, on Thursday. And until then, it's ciao.